Suddenly, the skies became covered with dark clouds, and with a deafening roar, the impregnable tower began to tremble, crack, and crumble, plunging everything around into chaos and panic. The bloody swords of the heroes stuck deep into the ground, as if silent witnesses to their harsh battle. They stood wearily watching as the majestic tower collapsed with a roar, swallowed up by chaos and dust. One of the heroes, without taking his eyes off the collapsing tower, quietly told the other that it was all over. Suddenly, Adam appears from the dust and chaos, leaning on his staff and without one hand, with unshakable confidence in his voice, he says that this is not the end. A figure in a lion's skin cape emerges from the group of heroes, peering intently at Adam. This is Alec, the hero of Olympus. He told Adam that despite his immortality, such behavior in front of the external gods is unacceptable. A well-aimed throw of the hand sends the blue sphere towards Adam and Alec. Bob stepped out of the shadows, his figure in sharp contrast with the surrounding light. The heroes looked at each other in amazement when they saw Bob emerge from the darkness as a mysterious figure, shrouded in mystery. Bob sank sadly onto the stone, as if the weight of his thoughts had become too great for one person. He, with a heavy sigh, said that only he survived, thanks to his unbridled strength and unyielding will, despite all the trials and dangers. These words shocked everyone present, forcing them to fall silent and look closely at Bob. He reiterated that everyone else was dead, while the color of the throne sphere suddenly changed. The heroes turned to the sphere from which strange, mystical sounds were heard, forcing them to tense up and listen carefully. In this sphere, the voice of one of the external gods was heard, to which Adam screamed in horror, Bob silently nodded, confirming his words. Bob stood up and sadly declared that they could not defeat the outer gods. Suddenly, a stranger in a long cloak appeared in front of them, his face hidden in shadow. He motioned for Bob to sit down on the stone, as if his power was bearing down on him like a heavy weight. Bob's face expressed despair and understanding that there was no other choice but to submit to this method. The stranger turned out to be Kronos, the god of time, and invited Bob to go back in time and start over. Kronos took out his mechanism and pointed it towards Bob, mysteriously blinking the glowing time indicators. Bob peered into the mechanism of Kronos, as if plunging into the depths of time under its hypnotic influence. Looking at everyone else, Bob told them that this was their last chance. Bob was not chosen for this mission by chance. His role was predetermined, said Kronos. Adam was annoyed that Bob's choice for this mission was not left random, perhaps because it made him feel unfair or unappreciated. But Bob was the first to quickly adapt to the new reality and conditions of this world. So the choice fell on him. Alec approached the hero and sincerely wished him good luck in his feat. The others also expressed their wishes for good luck to the hero in his mission, filling him with support and inspiration. The Kronos mechanism began to slowly unwind in Bob's hand, emitting strange sounds and creating a feeling of unpredictable temporary force around him. The mechanism began to emit a bright light that filled the surrounding space, as if opening a portal to another dimension of time. The hero looked at his hands, illuminated by a bright light, and felt a feeling of incredible strength and responsibility for the upcoming task awakening inside him. Bob suddenly felt the world around him change. The next moment he moved out of the light of the Kronos mechanism and acquired a normal human appearance. Suddenly, when Bob already felt like an ordinary person, a strong blow flew into his face, making him flinch. Bob realized that Kronos had channeled the flow of time through him, and the next moment he found himself as a student experiencing his first week at university. Michael stood and smiled, observing what was happening around him with confidence and goodwill. Michael swung at Bob again, preparing for the next blow. But this time, Bob deftly dodged the blow, demonstrating his agility and reaction. Mike, furious, swung at Bob again, aiming his blow with even more force and determination. Bob knocks Michael out with a deft blow, delivering a precise and powerful blow that takes him out of the fight. Bob's eyes filled with determination and confidence, reflecting his readiness for any challenge and trial. Bob took his phone out of his pocket and looked at it. The clock showed late, only nine hours left. The city at night was beautiful. The lights of the skyscrapers twinkled like stars in the sky. The streets were lively and filled with a mysterious charm that can only be felt in the deep silence of the night. People were sitting in the restaurant, deep in their conversations and smiles, enjoying the atmosphere and delicious food, surrounded by pleasant music and warm lighting. Michael was unhappy that there were so many people in the restaurant, which prevented him from enjoying the atmosphere and communication. But among the many people, he finally saw his friends, and this immediately made his mood better. He walked over to the table where his friends were sitting and grabbed a glass of drink, joining the group with a smile on his face. Michael took a sip of the drink, feeling its warmth and aroma, 
Then he smiled at his friends and sat down at the table, joining the general conversation and atmosphere of fun. They struck up a friendly conversation full of laughter and fond memories, sharing news and discussing plans for the future, enjoying their time together. Suddenly, Michael remembered how Bob hit him and fell silent for a moment, realizing past events. Michael was curious about how Bob spent his weekend at the university, whether there were activities, studying, or something unexpected happened. He also remembered how he was bleeding, and this memory gave him a slight trembling and an unpleasant sensation that clouded his current thoughts. But remembering that he was among friends, he relaxed, allowing the warmth of their company and friendly conversation to push away the dark memories. They raised their glasses and clinked their glasses amicably, enjoying the moment and strengthening their camaraderie. Afterwards, they went outside, enjoying the cool night air and the sounds of the night city, which was full of life and energy. They stood on the street, thinking about how else to entertain themselves, their thoughts hovering around various ideas, from going to a nightclub to a night walk in the park. Suddenly, they noticed Bob, who was rolling a suitcase on wheels along the sidewalk. Michael was very surprised by Bob's appearance and frowned a little irritably, not expecting to see him here with a suitcase. They decided to catch up with Bob and greet him. Walking quickly along the sidewalk, they caught up with him, and Michael, hiding his irritation, was the first to call out to him. Bob stopped and turned around, seeing familiar faces. His expression did not change, the hero said with a mysterious smile. Enjoy it while you can. There is very little time left. The apocalypse will begin soon. Bob took off his watch, threw it next to the suitcase which he placed on the ground, and began to open it. Mike was shocked when he saw what was in the suitcase. The suitcase contained many knives and axes of different shapes and sizes. Their blades glinted in the light. Bob took one of the knives in his hand, feeling its weight and sharpness. He took an axe in his other hand, and those around him watched this action in horror. Having hung the axe on his belt and thrown the backpack, which was also in the suitcase, over his shoulder, Bob stood up, holding the knife in his hand. Bob's gaze was indifferent, as if he was already accustomed to the unusual surroundings and was ready for any test since he understood what would begin in the near future. The clock showed just before 12 o'clock, and everything was just beginning. People around began to grab their heads, feeling the approach of something terrible or unexpected. All over the city, luminous points began to blink and appear like stars on the celestial sphere. Everyone around was holding their heads in pain, but Bob was unaffected. Michael, terrified and in pain, could not understand what was happening around him. Zombies began to appear on the streets of the city, and those around them were shocked by this unexpected and terrible event. Screams of horror were heard from different sides, but Bob knew that this was possible and was ready for it. Bob's gaze was decisive and prescient. He realized that something was about to begin that would greatly influence the world around him. Zombies began to wreak havoc around, spreading horror and chaos among those around them. A crowd of zombies was approaching Bob, and he prepared for battle. The hero held the knife tightly in his hands, ready to repel any zombie attack. The rest defended themselves as best they could, with hammers and knives trying to fend off the advancing zombies. The hero took out a small bottle filled with something unknown and opened it. Bob smeared the knife blade with an unknown liquid, preparing to use it in the fight against zombies. A real meat grinder began. Zombies were advancing from all sides, and the main character and the others were fighting for their lives, using all available means. The character fought with zombies, fighting them off with weapons in hand and trying to save survivors in this merciless clash. Zombies fell from the blows of the protagonist. He chopped and shredded them into pieces. It turned out that the world was immersed in the game, and by killing zombies, Bob increased his level. The streets of the city were infested with zombies. There was blood and panic everywhere. People fled in terror, trying to survive in this merciless battle for survival. One of the people was armed with an axe preparing to fight off the zombies and defend themselves in this fight for survival. He hit the zombie hard with the axe, trying to disable it and protect himself from the attack. But the zombie responded by attacking the character after receiving a blow. The zombie mercilessly grabbed onto the character's neck, trying to eat him. Bob realized that defeating zombies required unusual strength and strategy. Otherwise, he would not be able to resist them. The main character continued to fight off the crowds of zombies, increasing his level. Suddenly, he noticed that the blow to one of the zombies did not cause damage, which meant the end of the effect of the liquid with which he lubricated the weapon. The main character quickly jumped back, avoiding the powerful blow of the zombie, which directed its blow in his direction. Bob reached into his pocket to take out another bottle of liquid. The hero threw the bottle into the air and, waving his knife, cut it in half. The blade was again smeared with liquid. The main character recalled Jack's words. 
He told him the secret of how to defeat the first level zombies. To defeat zombies, you need a solution of salt and water. This is the advice he heard from Jack. The mysterious liquid turned out to be saline solution. Bob continued to fight the zombies. Bob received an in-game achievement for quickly killing zombies and could now choose three skills. The main character began to carefully study the available skills, assessing their advantages and disadvantages in order to choose the most useful for further battles. But not finding anything useful at the moment, the hero decided to save skill points for the future. The zombies approached Bob, their muffled groans and shuffling steps filling the street. Suddenly, the hero heard a loud sound that echoed down the street, attracting the attention of both him and the zombies. Someone tried to stab the zombie, waving a knife and making loud noises in an attempt to fight it off. It was Michael who was fighting the zombies furiously, waving his weapon and trying to fight off the attacking dead. But Michael didn't do much. His blows did virtually no damage to the zombies. He kicked the zombie desperately, trying to push it away and buy some time. Michael then took off running with his friends, desperate to find safe shelter. Michael's friends were terrified by the number of zombies surrounding them on all sides, and panic gripped them. The zombies were gaining on them, their muffled groans and inexorable advance drawing ever closer. Michael swung his knife, unleashing a decisive blow, hoping to stop at least some of the zombies. But at the most critical moment, Michael's weapon broke. The blade of the knife crumbled in his hands, and the character, desperately looking at the useless fragment, thought that the end had come for him. The zombie approached Michael and extended its decayed hand towards him, slowly and ominously reaching towards his face. When suddenly the zombie was struck by something, he suddenly stopped and with a dull groan began to fall to the ground. All the zombies fell to the ground due to the strange dust flying in the air. White dust rained down from above, slowly settling to the ground as zombies, deprived of their strength, lay on the asphalt. Michael carefully tasted the white dust, feeling its strange, slightly salty texture, and guessed that it was salt. It turned out that it was Bob who scattered salt through the air, creating an effect that paralyzed the zombies and stopped their advance. Bob stopped to estimate how many zombies had died from the spilled salt. It turned out that the salt destroyed all the zombies. The main character threw his backpack over his shoulder and, making sure that everything was safe, got ready to move on. A voice from nowhere congratulated everyone on their survival, its words echoing through the empty streets. People did not understand what was happening. Their faces expressed complete confusion and confusion. The voice continued to talk, explaining the basic mechanics of the game, controlling and using items. The voice also explained how to trade in this game world, how to find merchants, how to exchange resources and items. Bob, having confirmed the words of the voice, got ready to leave, confidently heading deeper into the city. Suddenly, a second wave began in the city, and the roar of footsteps and inhuman groans echoed through the streets again returning chaos and danger. The ground underfoot began to vibrate, foreshadowing the approach of a new threat. Michael put his hand to his head, feeling the tension and confusion take over him. The character did not understand where Bob had gone. His gaze darted around the surrounding panic and chaos. Michael and his friends tried to find Bob in the crowd, through the panicked screams and bustle, looking for him. Suddenly they noticed him. Bob was walking through the crowd, confidently and decisively, as if he knew the exact direction and goal. Michael rushed to catch up with the main character, making his way through the crowd. The character grabbed Bob by the shoulder, interrupting his movement, and said that he was going the wrong way. Michael wanted Bob to go with them, insistently saying so. But Bob, with a determined expression on his face, replied that he knew where he needed to go and did not want to join Michael. The hero advised Michael to find a safe area and take refuge there while he continued on his way. Bob added that Michael should not be arrogant and not underestimate the danger. Michael was furious and was about to stab Bob in the back. Clenching his fist and unable to contain his irritation, Michael was ready to strike. But Michael was stopped by strange sounds coming from the darkness. These were rustling sounds and dull groans. The character quickly decided to hide in a safe zone, realizing that a new threat was approaching. From under the ground, something suddenly grabbed one of the people, tearing him out of the crowd with tremendous force. Michael was terrified. His eyes widened in fear when he saw this. A huge worm, Bursting out of the ground swallowed the manhole, leaving behind only dug up earth and instant silence. Bob, seeing what happened, was not taken aback and struck a powerful blow to the worm, trying to break its jaws and drive the creature away. The main character, gathering all his strength, struck a decisive blow and cut the worm in half, forcing it to spew out green mucus and scraps of flesh. Bob heard cries for help coming from the streets and from somewhere far away. He needed to move on and go down to the subway despite the painful screams and urgent desire to help. 
He could barely restrain himself and for a moment was ready to go to the rescue, but changed his mind. The hero found himself below, where it was dark all around and oppressive darkness enveloped the entire space. Worms began to emerge from the darkness, their writhing bodies crawling in every direction, and Bob, armed with a knife and an axe, entered the battle. Bob dealt with the worms, methodically and decisively cutting them down until their torn bodies littered the ground around him. The hero's level increased and Bob, despite fatigue and tension, remained calm. Bob continued his descent into the depths of the subway, making his way through the darkness and debris. The hero came to a certain place and prepared himself, carefully examining the surrounding area. The subway was infested with worms, their writhing bodies filled the tunnels, creating an eerie picture of decay and chaos. The walls were covered in slime, and an unpleasant smell and rustling sounds filled the air. The worms sensed Bob, their receptors sensed his presence, they began to move and wriggle, rushing towards him. Bob prepared for the upcoming battle. He stood in a fighting stance, holding his weapon tightly. The main character took out a second knife, carefully took it out of its sheath and confidently squeezed the blade in each hand. The worm opened its huge mouth, its teeth like sharp fangs, glistening in the dim light. Bob began the attack, rushing forward with lightning speed. He delivered sharp and precise blows with his knives at the writhing worms, aiming for vulnerable spots. There was a splash of slime as Bob's knives pierced the worm's flesh, tearing it and causing the green mass to fly out. Suddenly, a bead sparkling with a bright light flew out of one of the worms. It hovered in the air, emitting powerful energy waves. Bob was surprised to discover that these beads could be collected right here. The hero quickly picked up the bead, its soft glow illuminating his hand. Bob decided that all the worms needed to be destroyed in order to collect more beads. Meanwhile, chaos was happening in the streets. The worms continued to attack. People screamed and panicked. Cars were overturned and those who were in the safe zone began to study the mechanics of the game, they carefully looked through the instructions. The safe zone began to gradually shrink, its boundaries gradually narrowed. People began to be randomly expelled from the safe zone. Many people found themselves outside the safe zone, and they soon found themselves engulfed in chaos. They were immediately attacked by worms. These terrible creatures, sensing new prey, quickly wriggled and attacked. The worms ate more and more people, devouring their bodies with terrible greed, their huge mouths filled with sharp teeth, capturing and tearing people apart. People began to panic when, faced with the incessant attacks of the worms, they began to fight among themselves. They tried to run, desperately looking for some kind of shelter or safe place. Michael, overcome with despair, shouted for everyone to shut up. People turned in his direction, interrupting their screams and fights, their faces distorted with fear and fatigue. Michael said with rage in his voice that now they had to choose who would die in his place. So that he could get out of here and survive, his words hung in the air like a threat. Michael grabbed one poor guy by the chest, his eyes were burning with crazy fire. With the words, I will kill this old man, he held it as if it was the only barrier between him and survival. Meanwhile, Bob continued to fight the worms, there was not a second of peace in his actions. Bob attacked and defended at the same time, his movements flawlessly perfected. The worms kept climbing and climbing, their numbers seemed endless. They stretched out from all the cracks and cracks, their writhing bodies filled the space. Finally, Bob killed all the worms, his weapon still glinting in the dim light, covered in blood and mucus. The hero, wiping sweat and blood from his face, bent over the bodies of the fallen worms and began to collect the scattered beads into a bag. There was a terrible stench emanating from the decaying bodies of worms. Finally, Bob decided to distribute the experience points that he had accumulated during the battle. Bob spent all his experience points on increasing his mana. The hero continued his journey deeper, confident in his new powers. Suddenly Bob turned around, feeling that someone was watching him. Someone was watching him from a hole in the ceiling. A shadow flickered in the dark opening, revealing a hidden observer. Bob asked into the darkness who you are. His voice was full of wariness, and his gaze was directed straight into the hole. Suddenly, Ava appeared from the hole looking like a small doll. Ava, the skill merchant, noted with a slight laugh that Bob was the first customer, and her eyes sparkled with interest. Bob decided to see what Ava had to offer. The hero began to study with interest her range of skills, which she was ready to sell. The range was huge, and Bob took time to carefully study all the skills on offer. But Bob couldn't find what he really needed and was afraid of attracting attention. But still, the main character decided to buy the skill of monkey eyes, and the skill of enveloping a sword in mana. Ava thanked her for the purchase and decided to leave. Bob prepared to move on, leaving behind a mountain of dead worms. 
their severed bodies lying randomly on the floor of the tunnel. Suddenly, the hero became thoughtful. His gaze became clouded, and he froze for a moment. He remembered the words of Kronos, who told him about the importance of time and that every decision made could change the future. Having considered Kronos' words, Bob took a deep breath, collected his thoughts, and resolutely moved further along the tunnel. More worms awaited Bob ahead, their ominous silhouettes flickering in the dim light. The worms were eating the people caught above, their jaws crunching as they tore through the flesh, creating terrifying sounds. The creatures sensed Bob, their heads turned in his direction, emitting a threatening hiss. Bob readied himself to attack, his hands holding his weapon tightly and his eyes focused. The main character decided to use a new skill by activating monkey eyes and a sword with mana. Suddenly, the main boss, a massive creature with a terrifying appearance, appeared from the pile of worms. The hero deftly repelled the attacks of the worms. His movements were fast and accurate. The boss let out a deafening scream that shook the air and caused Bob's body to tremble. The large worm headed towards Bob, opening its huge mouth, ready to swallow him whole. The main character deftly jumped into the air, avoiding the grip of the giant worm's mouth and flying over his head. Bob was about to attack the worm, his weapon ready to deliver the final blow to the giant enemy's weak spot. The hero was already anticipating victory. His face was tense but determined, and he focused on the last powerful blow. Bob struck, and green goo sprayed out of the worm's wound. The main character took the axe in his second hand, preparing to continue the attack. Bob struck with both weapons simultaneously, his knife and axe quickly meeting the worm's skin. A small smile appeared on Bob's face as he realized that the worm, struck by his blows, began to show signs of weakness. The hero delivers more blows, each of which is accurate and powerful. Splashes of mucus flew everywhere, flooding the surface of the tunnel. Bob's new skill, monkey eyes, kicked in, and his vision became incredibly sharp, allowing him to notice the worm's tiny movements. Bob used the skill on the sword again, its blade sparkling with new, magical energy, sharpening its sharpness and strength. The main character and the worm clash in a decisive confrontation. Bob's eyes glowed with a bright, penetrating light, reflecting his concentration. Meanwhile, the man grabbed his leg. He realized that he was wounded and could not continue to fight. Michael threatened the man, his voice filled with anger and tension as he screamed. The character pointed his knife towards the man, his hand shaking with rage. Michael shouted that a man should die in his place. Michael's face was embittered, his features twisted into an expression of rage and despair as he stared at the man. The safe zone was gradually shrinking, and the man was left outside it, desperately trying to get inside. The people in the safe zone were in complete horror as they watched Michael violently push the man away. Suddenly, a loud countdown sounded, echoing through the safe zone. The last three seconds flashed on the timer screen. The timer suddenly froze at the last second, and those around him froze in anticipation. Michael was full of surprise and bewilderment. In the subway, Bob, exhausted after fighting the main worm, sat on the carcass of a huge monster. Ava, watching Bob, circled around him enthusiastically. Her eyes widened in surprise. The character offered Bob a special reward for destroying the Great Worm early. Ava gave Bob the choice of one of three rewards, each of which concealed unique abilities and powers. Bob was a little confused by the selection of rewards offered, not knowing which one to choose. The main character thought that a connection with Olympus would not be useful to him at the moment and decided to postpone this choice. But Ava began to describe in detail all the charms and advantages of choosing a connection with Olympus, trying to convince Bob of its benefits. But Bob resolutely refused, preferring to focus on his current goals and chose simple rewards. Ava tried to convince Bob again, describing how his connection to Olympus could be his key to strength. But Bob didn't want to listen to her and resolutely jumped off the worm's corpse, the hero decided that it was time to call the distributor to a meeting. A huge, powerful man with a massive build and a stern look appeared in front of the hero. His powerful body and confident posture showed him to be more than just a manager. Duke, impressed by Bob's ability to summon him to a meeting, asked with interest how he learned this rare skill. Bob replied that he knew about the first rule Duke made and used it to call him to a meeting. Duke stood silently, carefully watching Bob without saying a word. Duke became very interested. Bob complained to Duke about Ava, explaining that she was offering him a connection to Olympus, which he did not want. This infuriated Duke and he hit Ava with rage. Duke slammed Ava, and shaking off his hand, looked at Bob with a cold gaze. Bob decided to ask for a reward, explaining that he expected to be fairly rewarded for his determination and strength in fighting the worms. Duke said he had an idea, but still he squinted thoughtfully, 
his gaze becoming suspicious. Duke, curious and suspicious, leaned closer to Bob and asked how one member managed to kill so many worms on his own. Bob coldly replied that it was none of his business, Duke, without looking away, extended his hand to Bob, expecting him to accept his offer. The main character looked carefully at Duke's outstretched hand. Bob extended his hand and accepted Duke's award, feeling his heart beat faster in anticipation. Magic light enveloped him, raising the hero's mana level. Duke nodded to Bob, confirming that the reward had been presented, and with a faint grin, he turned around, the magical light surrounding him, and he disappeared. Bob was left alone among the dead worms, their decomposed bodies a reminder of the battle that had recently taken place. The main character was surprised by the reward. He did not expect to receive such a boost so early. Bob was able to create a sparkling sphere in his hand that emitted a powerful energy flow. The hero tried to use the sphere, but it turned out to be unstable and, emitting a bright burst of energy, shattered into pieces, leaving him surrounded by debris and sparks. However, Bob was happy, realizing that this was just the beginning. A new wave of worms began to approach Bob, their ominous bodies covered in mucus and moving with an eerie hiss. Bob entered the fray again, his determined gaze sweeping over the crawling worms. Meanwhile, a lively argument broke out in the safe zone, and people in this confined space began to quarrel. People in the safe zone continued to panic and feel fear, their tension and anxiety only increased. Michael again grabbed the other unfortunate man by the chest. The face was distorted with rage and despair. The character, squeezing the poor fellow by the chest, looked at him with an icy expression on his face, full of despair and cruelty. From afar, Bob's figure appeared, illuminated by the dim light of the collapsing city. People who saw Bob in this state thought he might be crazy. Suddenly, a huge worm burst out of the ground and quickly attacked Bob. The worm opened its huge mouth again, targeting Bob, ready to swallow him whole. Bob jumped up and, using his new skill, attacked the worm from above with a running start. Splashes of green mucus accompanied by loud splashes reached people. Michael was surprised as he watched Bob fight the huge worm with determination. Bob's face was stoic, full of determination and concentration. Bob approached Michael, leaving behind the worm's mangled body and the slime-strewn streets. Michael, brushing the remaining dust and mucus from his face, hugged Bob tightly. The rest, sighing with relief, took out knives and food that they were able to save in the safe zone. While the rest of the people were organizing their supplies, Michael and Bob found a corner where they could talk without interruption. The main character accused Michael of taking advantage of others while Bob was risking his life and fighting the worms. Bob said it was very strange that Michael ignored real threats and relied on others for help. Michael became furious at Bob's accusations and began to threaten him. The character, enraged, briefly explained to Bob that the people were bringing him food because he had become their only leader and savior in this chaos. Bob was not interested in listening to Michael's excuses and started to leave, ignoring his attempts to explain the situation. Michael threatened Bob that if he didn't stay, he would definitely regret it. But Bob, not paying attention to Michael's threats, continued on his way, deciding not to waste time on useless conflicts. Suddenly, strange creatures began to crawl from the dark corners of the city. Their writhing bodies and creepy faces covered the walls of the buildings. A new wave began. Spiders and zombies filled the streets of the city. Their clusters covered the ground. The streets were infested with zombies and spiders that crawled from every nook and cranny, filling the city in endless streams, searching for any living creatures. The people, having gathered their last strength, armed themselves with everything they could find, knives and axes. Michael noticed a narrow passage between the ruins, which could be his only chance of salvation. Bob suddenly began shaking beads out of his bag, causing bewilderment and wariness among everyone around him. The creatures were crawling out of the subway and rapidly approaching. The zombies made terrible moans, their voices echoed through the streets. Concentrating, Bob used his new skill, creating a sparkling sphere in his hand. The entire subway lit up with a bright blue light that emanated from the sphere in Bob's hand, scaring the creatures and zombies. The hero prepared to strike, concentrating all his power into a sparkling blue sphere. The hero struck with the sphere, and a powerful wave of energy blew the creatures and zombies to pieces, filling the subway with thick clouds of blue light. Bob was surprised by the power of the skill when the blue sphere tore apart a whole wave of creatures and zombies in front of him. After sitting down for a moment, the main character decided to rest. After a while, he began to collect the beads that fell from the destroyed monsters, carefully collecting each one. The surviving rats trembled in fear, hiding and watching. Around the hero lay pieces of monsters, torn and covered with mucus. Bob pulled out his knife, preparing for the next confrontation, 
waiting tensely. Meanwhile, a group of three people carefully moved along the subway. Ethan and John were deciding where to go next, discussing possible routes. Suddenly, Claire noticed something. It made her wary and take a closer look. She drew the attention of the others. Claire pointed to a convenience store at the end of the tunnel and said that there might be shelter or food there. John was delighted and hurried to the store, believing that it could be a safe place where they could find supplies and take a break from danger. Suddenly, a huge spider loomed over John, and he froze, preparing to attack. The spider bit Jack on the head with a terrible sound, and bloody splashes scattered in different directions. Ethan and Claire watched in horror as a huge spider tore off John's head. His body no longer moved, and blood continued to ooze from the wound. The spider was eating his head and creatures crawled out from different sides. The heroes, with shaking hands, took out their weapons, their faces pale with fear. A huge rat, as if from the depths of a nightmare, emerged from the darkness and was rapidly approaching Claire. Claire quickly came to her senses and, grabbing the weapon, struck a decisive blow. One of the rats, large and vicious, grabbed Claire's hand with its sharp teeth. At this time, Ethan was completely focused on fighting the zombies that began to surround him and Claire. The zombie suddenly grabbed onto Ethan's hand, its sharp claws and teeth digging into the skin. Claire had difficulty fighting off the rats, who were not far behind her, trying to devour her. A huge spider was approaching them. The rat jumped towards Claire, trying to eat her. Suddenly, something cut the rat in half, scattering blood and meat on both sides. Claire, covered in blood, stood there, not understanding what had happened. Bob, with an annoyed expression on his face, told Claire and Ethan that they had woken him up while he was enjoying himself with a can of soda. The main character in front of Claire annoyedly threw a can of soda at the monsters, and the zombie, having been hit by the can, instantly lost its head which flew to the side. Bob took out his knife and prepared for the next attack. The hero, using a knife with skill, began to chop up the monsters one after another, their bodies flying into pieces. The last thing Bob finished off was a giant spider, which, despite its menacing form, fell to the powerful blows. All the monsters were destroyed, and silence once again enveloped the abandoned subway tunnels. Bob looked at Claire and Ethan, their faces covered in blood and fear. Claire and Ethan thanked Bob for saving them, wiping the blood from their faces and trying to catch their breath. Ethan, seriously wounded, fell to his knee, holding back a groan of pain. The main character threw the ointment to them and told Ethan to treat the wound. Claire caught the ointment and thanked Bob again. Bob added that the ointment had to be applied as quickly as possible, otherwise Ethan would not be able to use his arm. The hero thought to himself that he only slept for six hours, but he wants more. He had been fighting for a long time and felt very tired. Therefore, I decided to rest and did not think that anyone would disturb him. Claire asked if Bob hunted here all the time and if they could join him. The main character looked at Claire and Ethan, who were sitting on the floor trying to cope with shock and injuries. Bob invited Claire and Ethan to go hunting with him. After some time, they arrived at a place that was more like a cave, where stone walls were hidden in the depths. Bob told them to get ready because there was a monster ahead of them. There was a deafening roar that made the cave walls shake and echoed off the stone walls. Ethan and Claire were frightened, their faces pale with fear. Bob stopped and, looking at Ethan and Claire, asked with caution, Where are the guarantees that I won't kill you? The heroes were a little confused, not knowing how to answer Bob's unexpected question. The main character continued, saying that maybe he wanted to take their essences. Bob continued, even if I don't kill you, you'll still die here. Claire thought it was strange. Why did Bob invite them with him if he had such intentions? And then Claire asked what Bob wanted from them. The hero said that he needed their help, and if they succeeded, he would share the entities with them in half. Suddenly, a huge snake appeared and opened its mouth, preparing to attack. Ethan began to scream and run to distract the attention of the huge snake. The character recalled Bob's words before the battle, when he spoke about the importance of tactics and teamwork. Ethan continued to run, maneuvering and luring the snake behind him to divert its attention. The snake was about to swallow Ethan when Bob suddenly appeared. The hero plunged the knife straight into the snake's mouth and blood gushed out. Next, Bob headed towards the lizard, trying not to miss the moment and not give it the opportunity to attack. Bob dealt a decisive blow to the lizard. The hero continued to mercilessly chop the lizard, tearing it into pieces. Ethan watched in amazement as Bob destroyed the lizard with incredible speed and skill. Pieces of the monsters flew in all directions as Bob fought, and soon the entire floor was littered with scraps of meat and blood. Beads began to emerge from the torn bodies and fell to the ground. Ethan, still impressed by Bob's skill, quickly began collecting beads so as not to miss a single one. The main character, after making sure that the monsters were destroyed, 
approached Aiton and began collecting the beads with him. Bob, covered in blood and with a burnt-out look and a tired look, Ethan looked at Bob, once again convinced that his strength and skill were amazing. The main character asked how many entities fell out. Ethan answered Bob that six essences fell out, then Bob allowed Ethan to leave one. Ethan asked Bob what level he was. Bob replied that his level was no longer increasing, and Ethan was amazed by this. The main character advised Aiton not to ask about levels and skills, as this is personal information. Ethan remembered that Bob asked him about endurance, to which Bob replied that it was different. Bob also gave advice that you need to not only collect essences, but also level up to become stronger. Suddenly Claire appeared, and a pack of monsters was chasing her. Ethan tensed a little, but Bob was pleased, preparing for a new battle. At the same time, Bob walked towards Claire, preparing to help her. Aiton also joined the battle and began fighting with a hammer, hoping to increase his level. During the battle, Claire and Ethan's levels increased. Bob asked if they were done fighting. The main character reached for the entity that was lying on the ground. Taking the essence, Bob gave it to Claire, saying that this was her reward for her help. Bob also thanked them for their help, noting that now the hunt will be twice as productive thanks to their efforts. The hero headed towards the exit, saying that they needed to rise to the surface. Ethan and Claire were glad that they could go to the surface and find out what was happening there. The portal on the city street turned scarlet, which meant its imminent opening. Two people standing in the shadows exchanged quick phrases, their eyes sparkling with cunning and confusion. Their interest in Michael was clearly wary and calculating. With a decisive step, Michael, noticing their attention, headed towards them. Both looked at Michael curiously. Their faces remained wary. They were clearly preparing for a conversation. Michael's voice was indifferent. He asked where they were because he had not seen them for a long time. The hero noticed that the faces of the people in front of him tensed. They were clearly not happy about his appearance. Michael, looking at both of them, said, with the opening of the gates, blood will spill. I know how to solve the situation, Michael said confidently, and suggested a survival plan. The price was too high, the character in the gray jacket thought to himself. They wouldn't have that many entities. He clenched his fist in anger and the absurdity of the demand. Michael offered to give him 400, and then he would think about solving the problem. Then he thought to himself that if these two refused, a massacre would begin. Everyone around froze, feeling the growing tension. Everyone was waiting for an answer, as if this moment could decide the fate of everyone present. Suddenly, Claire and Ethan stood out from the crowd. The character in the gray jacket was surprised to see Bob walking behind Claire and Ethan. Bob was carrying a box in his hands, attracting everyone's attention. Michael asked where he was. Bob replied that he was doing business and put the box on the ground. Bob's gaze was firm and serious as he looked around at everyone gathered. Bob opened a box full of glowing entities and showed them to everyone present. People gasped when they saw how many entities were in the box. Michael, stunned, asked exactly how many entities there were, to which Bob calmly replied, more than a thousand. How did this son of a bitch collect so much? Michael thought to himself. Michael figured out how many people were behind him, and that together, they could take everything from Bob. Bob began to say, don't think that you will be able to take these entities from me. Any attempt will cost you your life. Michael thought about it, taking a closer look at what Bob showed. You need these essences and I have them in abundance, Bob continued. People began to scream and ask for the essences to be given to them, their voices overlapping each other in a chaotic chorus of outrage. He drew a circle around himself, confidently sitting inside it, and announced, I have an offer for you. I am ready to exchange each essence for 100 skill points. This is my price. Everyone started counting their points to find out how profitable it would be for them to exchange essences for skill points. Michael took out a knife and pointed it towards Bob. He held it confidently in his hand. His voice became cold and hard when he asked what if there was nothing to pay, to which the main character replied that he did not force them to buy them. Listen here, you son of a bitch. If you think you can manipulate us that easily, then I'm here to remind you who really has the power here, Michael said. Ethan and Claire immediately reacted to Michael's threat. They reminded him who killed their friend and why they ran away from Michael in the subway. Both heroes stood next to Bob, demonstrating their willingness to protect him at all costs, despite the danger. Michael, holding back his rage, laughed and said that there are only three of you. What can you do against all this crowd and my people? The character, feeling the growing tension and seeing that his authority was beginning to waver, shouted, Kill them all. No compromises. A couple of people who were trying to surround Bob were rapidly approaching. The hero pulled out a knife. His movements were lightning fast. He cut off the heads of two attackers with one precise blow. Michael, seeing how Bob dealt with two attackers with ease and determination, was horrified. 
The others, seeing this, did not dare to approach him. With confused faces and whispers, they began to retreat. Michael remembered Bob's words when he offered to exchange essences for skill points. Bob reiterated that purchasing the entities was their choice, but if anyone crossed the line with another target, he would not hesitate to kill them. Bob's gaze was hard and there was unshakable determination in his eyes. Michael again ordered Bob to be killed, and the crowd moved towards Bob again. The main character was left with no other choice he had to fight. He decisively swung his knife, cut off heads and repelled attacks. A mountain of bodies formed around Bob, splashes of blood flying wildly. Full of rage, Michael, deciding that he himself would become an example for others, grabbed a knife. Eager to end this battle once and for all, Michael charged at Bob, fury in his eyes. Bob prepared to attack, his hands ready for a decisive counterattack. Bob's eyes sparkled with determination as he watched Michael rush towards him. Michael thought for a moment, realizing that his determination could cost him his life. But it was too late. The main character cut off his head with one decisive blow. Dead bodies lay all around Bob, and blood formed puddles on the ground. Bob took the box of entities that was lying on the ground. The character in the gray jacket stood in shock. He thought to himself how Bob was able to defeat so many people. He shouted that he was ready to buy the essences. The character decided to sell his sword for skill points, and then use those points to buy essence. He thought again and headed towards Bob. Bob was about to enter the portal, but he put the box on the ground. The main character turned to the approaching man, ready to listen to his proposal. The man in the jacket, with an urgent expression on his face, extended his hand to Bob to begin bargaining. He asked Bob for seven entities. Bob, shaking hands with the man in the jacket, agreed to a deal, exchanging seven entities. The crowd watched the deal carefully, wondering how many skill points everyone had and whether they would have enough for essence. The man in the jacket quickly entered the portal, leaving the others to collect their skill points. Some of the crowd moved toward Bob, extending their arms and loudly shouting their suggestions. The rest began to call on the sixes to hastily sell their weapons. There was a buzz around. People crowded around, noisily discussing deals and trying to be the first to receive a valuable reward. Bob continued to sell essences, slickly making deals and quickly exchanging essences for skill points. Some tried to offer Bob unprofitable deals, but he agreed because he understood that the skill points would be useful to him in the future. The main character thought about it and realized that everything was going well for him anyway. After counting his skill points, Bob realized he had enough. Where should Bob go next? Claire asked him. The main character looked at Claire and Ethan, wondering why they had not left this place yet, given that the box was already empty and he was about to enter the portal. Claire and Ethan told Bob that they planned to go with him. The main character replied that he was not going to go into the portal. His plans had changed. He picked up his pouch from the ground, preparing for his next move. There are no more entities and he needs to get some for himself. Claire and Ethan were surprised at this. The hero shook the pouch, making sure that there were no more entities left inside. He threw the empty pouch which fell to the ground with a thud. The heroes looked at Bob and didn't understand why he didn't leave some essences for himself. Ethan decided to ask why Bob didn't keep some for himself, but sold everything. Bob explained that even though he had no intention of going into the portal, Ethan and Claire should take the opportunity to go there, as it could greatly increase their chances of survival. Ethan and Claire thanked Bob for his help and support. Afterwards, they said goodbye to him and headed towards the portal to take advantage of the opportunity. Bob thought about his next steps and planned how he could use his resources and skills. The main character turned around and saw a man running up to him in an exhausted state. The stranger asked if he was still selling entities, but Bob replied that the trade was completed. The stranger screamed. The stranger fell to his knee, his eyes full of despair. There was a loud roar. The remaining people grabbed their heads. The hero hurried along the alley, trying to stay away from the crowded square and its remaining people. Bob decided to summon the six and purchase items that might be needed for the upcoming trials. The main character was surprised when the manager himself came to his call. The hero asked why he came himself, because he needed a simple store. The manager explained that there were now problems with the sixes and decided to personally come to Bob. The work of the sixes was also suspended due to Bob's actions, the manager added. When everyone in this place began to call the sixes and sell them their weapons, the situation became very tense, the manager continued. It was because of this that the manager himself decided to come in order to establish order and regulate the flow of transactions, which had become unpredictable and chaotic. Bob, looking at the manager, said expectantly, Please open the store. I want to purchase several items and improvements. The main character looked insistently. He did not want to continue the dialogue so as not to attract attention. The manager raised his hand and it glowed with bright light. 
The character prepared to open the store. His hand began to slowly lower. Well, choose, he said, stepping aside. Bob carefully looked through the objects with his eyes, trying to find something that would help him. The main character chose a new sword. It was light and perfectly balanced. In addition to the sword, the hero chose a red robe and a shield. His hand gripped the hilt confidently, as if it had been made especially for him. The gleam of the blade reflecting determination. The manager, appreciating Bob's choice, nodded and said that now not a single person can touch you. He added that this only applies to the participants, which surprised Bob. At that same second, the manager disappeared, leaving Bob standing in the alley. The main character heard the sound of the countdown and raised his head up. Filling everything around with an ominous scarlet light, the sky turned fiery. Bob thought to himself that he had not seen such a fiery sky for a long time. When the hero left the alley, people began to run away in panic, leaving behind only traces of chaos and haste. One of the people, unable to withstand the scorching heat, fell to the ground, sweating and screaming in pain. Bob looked at the fallen man, sympathy flashing in his eyes. At that same second, a fireball fell on the man, burning him instantly and leaving only ashes on the ground. The main character dodged so that the fireball did not hit him and cast his gaze onto the street. The street was on fire. Tongues of flame opened up and mercilessly consumed everything around. A skeletal hand emerged from the ground, slowly reaching out from the ash and rubble. Following the hand, a skeleton emerged from the ground with fiery eyes that glowed brightly. Suddenly, a crowd of skeletons began to rise from the ground, their bone bodies creaking and rustling. Bob gripped the hilt of his new sword tightly and took a fighting stance. When the hero took a closer look at the horizon, he noticed that a more impressive figure was emerging behind the skeletons emerging from the ground. It was a huge fiery silhouette, shrouded in smoke and surrounded by gloomy light. A demon with huge, sparkling eyes emerged from the darkness against the backdrop of blazing lights and developing tongues of flame, Bob said, clutching the sword in his hands and looking straight at the demon. Finally, here you are. The silhouette of the demon was huge and fiery. His ominous eyes bored into Bob, and the red-hot tongues of flame escaping from his body tore the air around him. The demon noticed that Bob had interesting monkey eyes, and his voice echoed in the air like a clap of thunder. There was a piercing roar, and the demon, pointing at Bob, ordered the skeletons to attack. The demon pulled out a huge, fiery sword. It emitted bright flames and an ominous light. The skeletons, animated by the demon, walked towards Bob, their bone bodies creaking and crunching with every step. Feeling the flow of magic and energy concentrated in his body, Bob, brandishing a new sword, quickly began to fight the advancing skeletons. Skeletons fell like sand from Bob's blows, his sword, sparkling with blue light, rushing through the ranks of opponents. The demon powerfully slammed his fiery sword into the ground, creating a shockwave that broke through the ranks of skeletons and spread through the streets. The demon's fiery eyes sparkled with displeasure. He was surprised that Bob did not suffer damage from the destructive attack. The cloud of smoke slowly dissipated. The main character stood unharmed. His new cape perfectly protected him from fire. Sitting on a dais, the fiery eyes of the demon closely watched the battle, while the skeletons tirelessly continued their attacks on Bob. He wondered as he watched Bob's tireless resistance. Bob, with an unbending expression on his face, told the demon that he had come here to hunt him. The hero's eyes lit up with a bright light. He got ready. The hero jumped up as if preparing for the decisive jump but he was immediately thrown back by the demon's shockwave. Flames filled the street, consuming everything around in fiery chaos. Bob made his way through the wall of fire, getting closer to the demon with every step. The main character covered himself with a shield that could withstand explosions and flames. When the flames cleared, Bob stood, ashes flying past him. The skeletons continued to advance, moving through the rubble and ashes despite the destruction and flames they left in their wake. Bob noticed that his shield was worn out from constant impacts and explosions. Its protective properties had significantly decreased. Searcher, stop stalling, let's fight already, he shouted to the demon. The demon began to descend from above. It made a fluttering sound. Bob, looking at the demon, exclaimed, You are committing outrage, sending your servants to attack peaceful people and destroying this city. Searcher, waving his fiery sword, pointed it at Bob and said, You are a daring mortal. The main character, scratching his ear and not showing fear, replied, You may be powerful, but I will still kill you. The demon flew into a rage, his fiery eyes flashing brighter. Surtur swung his sword, tearing the air and causing a powerful shockwave that could destroy everything in its path. Bob covered himself with a shield to protect himself from a powerful demonic blow. 
The sword touched the shield, and there was a deafening sound, like a thunderclap which filled the air with vibrations. The hero's shield shattered into pieces under the powerful blow. Sparks and debris scattered in different directions. Bob quickly dodged the next blow by sliding to the side. The demon's sword struck the ground with an angry roar. The demon, seeing how Bob dodged the blow, anticipated his victory, his eyes blazing with rage and confidence in victory. Searcher, seeing how Bob dodged the blow, began to suspect that he deliberately exposed himself to the attack. The hero knelt in front of the demon. His breathing was heavy, and his face was covered with dust and blood. Surtur looked at him with contempt and curiosity. You're doing too much damage and it has to end, Bob said. Surtur continued to look at Bob in the silence broken only by the crackling of the fire. Bob stood surrounded by a wall of flames as the demon continued to watch him. Suddenly the hero, clenching his teeth, quickly grabbed the sword. He raised it, and the bright light from the blade tore apart the darkness around him. You think you can defeat me with this sword? Surtur said mockingly. Bob suddenly saw through the ice crystal that he purchased from the manager. The demon looked at the ice crystal in bewilderment, realizing that its fiery power no longer mattered. The demon instantly struck, but Bob managed to activate another ice crystal. Now Bob did not take damage from the high temperature, and when their swords touched, sparks flew in different directions. The demon was surprised to see how his powerful blow was unable to penetrate Bob's defense. Bob deflected the demon's sword, and he used this moment to strike back. The hero jumped, trying to deliver the decisive blow. The demon, sensing a threat, sharply pointed his fiery sword and flames soared around their fight. However, Bob managed to break through his defenses and left a deep wound on his fiery body. This only angered the demon, and Bob, trying not to retreat, watched his movements with tension. Searcher, with furious rage in his eyes, activated his fiery eye skill. Bob decided to dodge the stream of fire, trying to use his agility and speed. A furious stream of flame erupted, seeking to incinerate Bob. Using all his strength and technique, Bob fought off the demon's fiery stream with his sword. The hero used another ice crystal and decided to finish quickly, because his body could not withstand the low temperature for a long time. The demon swung his sword again, his fiery energy sparkling around the blade. Dodging the blow, Bob slid to the side and, using the moment, quickly headed towards the demon. Moving with incredible speed, he struck the demon's leg with a decisive blow, and his powerful blow made a dull sound. Surtur's eyes filled with rage and pain. The demon felt his strength begin to fade. From a strong blow, the demon fell to his knee with a deafening sound, as if thunder roared in the night. Bob wasted no time in taking advantage of the opportunity. He quickly jumped and found himself behind the demon, preparing for the decisive blow. Landing on the demon's back, Bob felt his body being exposed to intense heat, emanating from the fiery entity beneath him. The demon boiled with rage and shouted that Bob was an impudent person who dared to attack him in this way. Such intense heat emanated from the demon that the air around it seemed to melt. Bob's body was under great strain from the unbearable heat that emanated from the demon, forcing every muscle and every cell to fight the fire. Bob swung his sword around, preparing to strike the finishing blow. The protagonist activated the mana sword, and the blade of his weapon glowed with a bright magical light, enhanced by energy. Sticking the sword into Surtur's body, the blade pierced the flesh. The demon howled in pain, and the heat around him became even more intense. After the blow, Bob's sword was barely on the verge of breaking, its blade covered in cracks and emitting a dim light. Surtur fell to the ground with a dull thud, the fiery light emanating from him fading. Bob shouted in victory, his voice echoing through the deserted street filled with signs of battle. Immediately the hero remembered his comrades, joy pierced his heart. Bob had a tired but satisfied smile on his face. He slowly got to his feet and passed out. After a while, he woke up. Remembering the recent battle, next to him, on the battlefield covered with debris and ash, lay the body of a defeated demon. Burns were noticeable on the hero's hands. The burned skin turned red and blistered in places. Bob's thoughts flashed through images of a fierce battle, flashes of fire, thundering blows of a sword, his own exhausted figure. Moving with difficulty due to burns and fatigue, the hero walked towards the demon's body. His movements were slow. Bob began poking around the demon's corpse, trying to find something valuable. Finally, Bob found a crystal, which turned out to be the heart of Surtur. This crystal emitted a mysterious light. The main character wanted to immediately swallow the crystal to immediately gain its power, but realized that he did not have enough stamina points. Majestically and imperiously as before, the manager suddenly appeared in front of the hero, before Bob had time to put the crystal in his inventory. 
He continued to stand motionless in front of him as Bob jumped off the demon's body. You bring a lot of problems and upset the balance. Your actions have led to a large number of violations of order, the manager said, holding his head. First, I will send you to the next location. Your presence here has caused many problems and I will need to deal with the consequences, he continued. The manager extended his hand and Bob, hesitating only for a moment, also extended his. They shook hands. The other steward and I spent a lot of time deciding what reward to give you, the steward added. Bob received a new skill, a significant increase in skill points and increased stats. The hero immediately began learning a new skill that was previously unknown to him. Bob asked the steward for a small pill to restore his stamina after a brutal battle. While the hero was swallowing the pill, the manager was about to leave. He felt his wounds begin to heal, and his pain and fatigue gradually disappeared. The manager said goodbye to Bob, advising him to hurry into the portal. After the manager's words, Bob passed out. His body, exhausted from battles and wounds, could not stand it and fell into sleep. After a while, Bob began to teleport, his body gradually disappearing into the light. While Bob was teleported, he thought about what was happening. His thoughts were focused on recent events. Bob found himself in a new place. He slowly came to his senses and looked around, studying his surroundings. When the teleportation was completed, Bob found himself in a new place, surrounded by people he didn't know. These people looked like they had just arrived here. Their facial expressions were a mixture of curiosity and wariness. They looked at Bob with interest, but there was no sense of hostility between them. This place turned out to be a central area for participants from different locations. The voice was loud and clear. All participants froze in anticipation. Their attention was focused on the voice. The voice continued, adding instructions that this island was in the process of being sunk and that everyone had a limited time to prove their eligibility to continue participating in the trials. A deafening roar came from the volcano, signaling the start of the test on the sinking island. People began to perk up, actively preparing for tests and research. Bob thought for a second, realizing that he now had a new goal. Three people stood and discussed something, slowly, amid an alarming atmosphere. One of them suggested creating a team to survive the current situation together. The character in the white cape refused the offer with a smile, citing his own plans and preferences. He said that he trusts practically no one here and prefers to act alone. Bob noticed him. The character seemed familiar to him. One of the people rushed at the stranger with a white cape trying to attack him. The stranger's eyes glowed yellow, emitting an aura of power. People around were struck by bright yellow lightning. Sparks flew in different directions. Some bodies flew in the air struck by lightning, generated by the strange forces of the stranger. People fell, losing their balance and flying out in different directions like dolls on strings. When the stranger removed his hood, a striking appearance was revealed to those gathered. The others were amazed at the strength of the stranger, who, possessing an intimidating appearance and amazing power, showed with just one movement that he was capable of much. Bob assessed the stranger in his head, assessing him as a potential ally or enemy. The protagonist knew that the stranger was born in the tower, and this made him a particularly dangerous and potentially powerful adversary or valuable ally. The stranger looked a lot like one of the famous characters, Bob thought to himself. Bob continued to think, but I need to go somewhere else. I don't have time to deal with him. Suddenly, the stranger himself approached Bob. He didn't even understand how the stranger did it, but his dignity was felt even from a distance. The stranger introduced himself as Leo and, looking at Bob with interest, asked who you are. Leo pointed his finger at Bob's clothes and added with slight surprise, where you got such unusual clothes? The main character looked at Leo coldly, not succumbing to his provocations. Bob, with the same expression on his face, replied that he bought it for points. Leo, without taking his eyes off Bob, asked what his level was. Bob, remaining cool, replied that it was impolite to ask such questions. The character thought for a moment and then said approvingly that Bob was good for learning this important truth. Seeing in him the potential and strength needed to successfully complete the upcoming challenges, Leo invited Bob to join his team. Bob replied that he was not interested and not wanting to linger got ready to leave. Leo stood in disbelief as he watched Bob walk away without accepting his offer. The hero rushed after Bob with lightning speed, not wanting to let him go without an explanation. But Leo was stopped by rats, who suddenly jumped out of the shadows and surrounded him, blocking his path. He dealt with the rats and stopped. Behind Leo lay the corpses of rats, which he successfully destroyed with his lightning strike. His gaze was focused, but Bob was no longer visible. Bob eluded him, and Leo thought to himself that Bob really had a unique skill. Leo reflected, analyzing what was happening, and realized that Bob, despite his aloofness, 
could be of great value as an ally. The character, with a smile on his face, came up with a plan to lure Bob out. Meanwhile, Bob realized that he had pulled away and stopped. Bob was finally convinced that no one was following him, and that he was truly alone. The protagonist thought about the chase, wondering if Leo was actually interested in pursuing him, or if it was just a way to distract him. After some thought, Bob approached the cave, trying to explore its surroundings as carefully as possible. Suddenly, from the darkness of the cave, a creature attacked Bob. Its sharp claws and teeth sought to tear the hero's skin. Bob instantly reacted to the attack. In a few quick movements, he pulled out his sword and delivered a precise blow. The character dealt with several monsters inside the cave, leaving behind only pools of blood and destroyed bodies. In the cave, Bob sprayed a powder that muffled his smell so that no one could smell it. Bob sat down on the floor of the cave and took Surtur's heart out of his inventory. Bob's body was recovering and he decided to swallow the crystal. Fire spread through the hero's veins, filling his body with unknown energy. Bob's whole body burned to the point of madness. The flames spread through his veins, filling him with burning power and unbearable pain. Bob fell in pain, his body writhing on the ground, overcome by unbearable heat and agony. In agony, Bob saw the silhouette of a figure in a lion skin cape who emerged from the fire like a spirit. Bob screamed in pain until the fire from the crystal engulfed every cell of his being. As the fire died down, Bob's performance began to improve and the pain gradually subsided, giving him hope for relief. Bob collapsed to the ground again, his last strength exhausted as his body continued to adapt to the new power. The hero lay on the ground, his body was covered with sweat, but with every moment his condition improved, the fiery streaks on his skin gradually subsided. The main character, having acquired a new skill, could not withstand the load and passed out, losing consciousness from fatigue and pain. Six hours passed and Bob woke up. He slowly opened his eyes, feeling that the pain and burning that tormented him earlier had significantly decreased. A strange thought flashed through Bob's head. What if his further journey was not only a test of strength? Having fully recovered, Bob opened the leaderboard and saw that he was behind. Bob came out of the cave, and the sun's rays illuminated his face. Bob now had fiery eyes that glowed with a bright, fiery light. Ahead, Bob saw a village surrounded by greenery. Through a curtain of trees and bushes, he noticed low houses with thatched roofs. It was an orc village, different from the usual peaceful appearance. Round houses with thick walls, built from rough timber logs and stone. Bob slowly approached the orc village, his steps confident and persistent. The hero decided to test his new giant fire skill on the orcs, feeling that it could be a great way to evaluate the power of his recent improvements. All the houses and orcs in the village were on fire. The flames glowed brightly and raged in the air, consuming everything that remained intact. With each orc he killed, Bob felt his level growing, his strength and abilities improving. Leo and his companion stood on a hill, discussing possible actions. Henry was a tall man with green eyes, brown hair, and a green robe. Leo announced that the team needed another member with unique skills to increase their chances of success. But first, they needed to hunt to improve their skills and gather resources for the upcoming trials. Haley, a half-blood dark elf with white hair, created a blue sphere of energy in her hand. The heroes stood over the pit, looking into it, preparing for the upcoming test. Leo jumped into the hole, warning the others to stay away from the edges to avoid getting hit. The hero gathered his strength, concentrating the energy in his hand, and swung powerfully, preparing to strike. There was the sound of a strong impact, accompanied by a splash of yellow lightning that scattered across the pit, illuminating everything around. Henry, amazed at the scale of the destruction, asked in surprise if this was really the place they were talking about. Leo confirmed that this was the right place and invited the others to enter. Haley warily asked Leo what awaited them in this place. Leo looked carefully at the entrance to the cave, as if he was expecting something. Henry called out to Leo, warily watching his expression. Leo, angry that Bob had outscored him, rushed forward in a frenzy, destroying the caterpillars in his path. The others, observing Leo's swift and unreasonable act, watched in bewilderment as he went deeper into the cave. Thea, Haley's sister and half-blood dark elf, noticed Leo's competitive spirit and added that his desire to surpass Bob made him unpredictable. Henry stood a little embarrassed as a girl in light armor approached him. It was Meg originally from a mercenary family who wielded magic. The heroes caught up with Leo, and a fork opened in front of them. The road divided into two paths. Leo made the decision to split the team to explore both paths and increase the chances. Meg took out her weapon and prepared to follow one of the paths. The character swung her sword and, with a determined attitude, 
moved forward along with the rest of the squad. Huge caterpillars covered with hard shells appeared on the squad's path. Meg's movements were precise and graceful, each swing of the sword seeming to carve a path through the thick shells of the caterpillars, demonstrating skill and confidence. The rest were already tired of clearing the cave. Fatigue began to affect their actions. Henry's mana level had decreased, and he decided to conserve it so as not to deplete his resources before the end of the battle. A huge door appeared before the heroes, leading to the depths of the cave. Henry said that behind this door is the boss. Meg warned them not to relax and prepare for the upcoming battle. Henry said with a smile that everything was fine. Meg asked what was the matter. Suddenly, behind the massive gates, an eerie sound was heard, which resembled a deep growl, blocking all other sounds. The heroes gripped their weapons tightly, their fingers tense on the handles, ready to fight. Meg was the first to decisively enter the gate, her sword ready for action. In the hall where the heroes entered, everything was covered in blood. The blood spread across the floor, forming stinking puddles. The heroes looked questioningly, their eyes full of worry and tension. Henry noticed a shadow flashing in the corner of the hall. He immediately became alert and gave a signal to the others. The shadow's eyes radiated fire, their bright yellow light reminiscent of hot coals. As the shadow in front of them took shape, the heroes saw that it was Bob, his eyes sparkling with a bright flame. Bob now looked like something completely different, gifted and scary. A vivid and intense scene flashed through Bob's thoughts. The hero noted to himself that the boss was incredibly tenacious. Every attack and every magic he used against the boss didn't seem to be as effective as expected. But despite the incredible vitality of the boss, Bob won. The battle was difficult and exhausting. The fight against such a strong opponent showed what he was truly capable of, and despite the fatigue, he felt satisfied. Bob sat on the huge carcass of the monster. His breathing was still heavy from the recent battle. He turned to the heroes who entered the hall and said ironically, You are late. Thea, with surprise and disbelief in her voice, asked, Did you deal with him alone? Henry couldn't believe what he was seeing. I didn't even suspect that someone could be stronger than Leo he thought to himself. As you can see, I did it alone, Bob continued. Bob carefully assessed the heroes, noticing their surprise and confusion. The main character realized that they were divided into two groups to hunt. Bob turned his attention to Meg, realizing that she was behind Leo on the leaderboard, which could mean she was at a high level. Henry approached Bob with an offer to join their team, noting that their group needed strong players like him. The main character refused Henry's offer, after which Meg asked if he was going to go to the boss alone again. When Meg asked if he was going to go to the boss alone again, Bob answered yes. Meg reminded Bob that the point of beating a boss was to work as a team, not to fight alone. Bob didn't react to Meg's remark, continuing to stare intently. So what do you want? Bob began to say. Thea contacted Leo and reported the situation with Bob and that they were late to defeat the boss. Leo appeared in the hall at the same second. The hero, shouting Bob's name, walked towards him with all speed. Leo almost approached Bob, but he did not flinch, remaining standing in place with a cold expression on his face. Bob simply grabbed Leo's head and held him in place, preventing him from moving. With the next movement, Bob pressed Leo against the monster's carcass, holding him in a tight grip. Leo's allies looked on in surprise. Bob continued, letting Leo go. Do you want to survive or just beat the boss? Meg thought for a second, realizing that Bob was questioning their priorities. At that very second, Meg flew into a rage, Unable to withstand Bob's derogatory tone, Bob didn't react, remaining unperturbed by Meg's outburst. The main character, raising his finger up, said that his goal is not just to climb the tower, but to break through its ceiling. Leo finally broke free from Bob's grip and shouted, What are you doing? I thought you were going to attack, so I defended myself, Bob replied. When such a strong man rushes at you, that's all that's left, Bob continued. If so, then I'm sorry, Leo replied, and Henry was embarrassed noticing that this belief had an effect on him. Breaking through the ceiling is a very ambitious plan, Leo began to say. Bob replied, A sardine cannot swim with a whale. Don't think of me as some kind of sardine. Someday I will become a king, Leo replied. Leo's allies watched their dialogue with interest and bewilderment. Bob smiled slightly as he watched Leo and his allies react. Leo offered Bob a bet. If his team and he themselves were the first to kill the next boss, then Bob would agree to join their team. And if he and his team fail to take down the boss first, he will come to Bob's aid when he calls. Bob agreed to Leo's proposal, and they agreed to meet at the next boss to decide which of them could handle the task first. Bob jumped off the monster's carcass. Then see you at the next boss, Leo said, banging his fists. Bob was a little embarrassed and added, 
Good luck to you. Leo jumped off the monster's carcass and called his allies. We need to hurry, he said. Time is running out. Turning around and heading towards the exit from the hall, Bob raised his hand up and noticed that time had stopped. Leo, slightly surprised, asked what this meant. The main character answered, We are not on an island, but on a living creature. And these monsters were just parasites, Bob added. So this boss was the king of parasites, Leo said after looking at the carcass. And to get rid of the parasites, the creature had to dive underwater. And then the salt water would kill the parasites. But now that they are dead, the countdown has stopped, Bob explained and turned around. The two characters on the surface looked on in surprise as the countdown time suddenly stopped. They were fighting the orcs on the surface when the countdown suddenly froze. The sword quickly plunged into the head of the red orc, interrupting his battle cry. It was thrown by Bob's sword, hitting his target with precision. Other orcs looked at each other warily, sensing a growing threat. Bob retrieves the sword from the orc's corpse, intently assessing his next target. His eyes emitted a fiery light, preparing for the next clash. The orcs, seeing Bob's power and determination, began to run away in panic. The countdown has begun and Bob realizes that time is limited and he needs to act quickly. Lightning flashed brightly, striking the mountain and illuminating its surroundings. Heroes gathered at the top of the mountain, ready to face a new challenge. Thea and Henry watched as the heroes gathered at the top of the mountain, their eyes following every movement. Some of the heroes already looked much stronger. Their armor and weapons were more impressive. Meg approached Henry and Thea. She carefully examined those around her and said that not everyone would survive. They stood on a hill and watched what was happening below. Leo approached them his face focused and his eyes sparkling with determination. He said that it looked like everyone was preparing for the last stage. Henry noticed Bob among the crowd and turned in his direction. Bob confidently moved towards the heroes, his cape fluttering in the wind, and his every step radiated confidence and determination. The main character activated his skill. He carefully studied potential allies, assessing their strength and abilities. He noticed that Henry and Thea's mana flow had changed and they had become stronger. Leo greeted Bob with a slight smile and noticeable interest, his voice laced with respect and latent rivalry. The character asked, Will you still go to the boss alone? To which Bob replied that yes, he prefers to act alone, since he has his own goals and methods that suit him best. The man in black clothes invited Bob to team up, believing that his skills and strength would be a great addition to his team. Leo was instantly enraged when he saw the black-clad character asking Bob to join his team. The hero snapped his fingers and lightning appeared out of nowhere. Frightened, people began to run away in panic in different directions, and soon there was a commotion around them, with screams and running. Saying that time is precious, Bob headed towards the crater. Very interesting, Leo said with a smile, watching Bob approach the crater. Bob jumped into the crater, consumed by the desire to quickly deal with the boss. The main character landed, and a notification appeared that you had entered the boss room. The spirit of the upcoming battle was in the air. A horde of orcs appeared in front of Bob, led by a huge snake that slithered and hissed, demonstrating its terrifying strength. Following Bob, the rest of the heroes jumped into the crater. The two characters standing nearby were surprised by the number of orcs that surrounded them. Bob quickly took in his surroundings. Hordes of orcs and a huge snake, ready to attack, having identified the possible weak points of his opponents and his strengths, the hero prepared for battle. Bob took out his sword and used the fire whirlwind skill on it, the sword burst into flames. The other heroes watched with interest as Bob prepared for battle. They stood waiting to see what the hero was capable of. Leo crossed his arms and watched what was happening, assessing his abilities in battle. Henry, noticing Bob's disappearance, became alert and began to carefully examine the surrounding area. Bob attacked the orcs from above, using the element of surprise to inflict maximum damage. Henry and Thea were amazed by Bob's skill and his ability to launch sudden and powerful attacks. The main character plunged his sword into the large red orc, dealing a crushing blow. Bob's eyes glowed with fire, intensifying his rage and determination. Leo began to get angry as he watched Bob storm to victory. Eager to prove his strength and show that he is not inferior in fighting abilities, Leo decided to join Bob. Leo, with fury in his eyes, deftly broke the spears flying at him. Orc blood scattered to the sides, mixing with flashes of fire and light from the battle. Bob created a fiery whirlwind with his sword, which quickly tore the orcs and their armor into pieces. Leo's allies also decided to join the battle to support his Bob and destroy the remaining enemy forces. Meg and Henry ran, fighting orcs along the way and trying to provide support. Thea and Haley used their magic, creating powerful spells to weaken the orcs and make the battle easier. 
Henry used the concentration of mana in his hand, delivering devastating blows to the orcs. Bob noticed their coordinated work and appreciated how the magic and energy of their allies effectively destroyed their opponents. Their skills will definitely be useful in what is about to begin, the hero thought to himself. Leo froze, as if sensing great power. A majestic gate appeared before Leo, shrouded in a mysterious aura. Its surface was covered with patterns like ancient symbols. Leo and Bob peered at the gate, their hands running over the intricate patterns. When Bob began to slowly open the gate, Leo, seeing this, shouted, Are you going there alone too? Bob, not paying attention to Leo's screams, decisively stepped through the opened gate. Terrible screams were heard behind the gate, piercing and unnatural, which made the other heroes freeze in horror and fear envelop them. Leo clenched his fist, concentrating all his inner strength into it, and his hand became unnaturally bright. As they entered, a giant chimera with flaming eyes and claws appeared before their eyes. One look from the chimera froze the blood in their veins, and the heroes felt cold fear running through their bodies. But the chimera was chained to a huge magical cage. Its giant paws were enclosed in chains. Bob, not paying attention to the horror, slowly approached the cage. Leo, without taking his eyes off the locked chimera, asked if this was the final boss. To the side of Bob and Leo, at the foot of the ancient pedestal, the chimera control stone mysteriously sparkled. At that moment, a notification appeared in front of them, which said that the owner of the chimera receives additional points for killing heroes. Meg thought, her eyes clouded with worry. Bob walked towards the stone when Leo grabbed his shoulder. His voice was full of worry. Wait, we need to think first. With the words, let him go, Bob snatched the sword. His determination was unshakable. Bob destroyed the stone with a powerful blow and its ruins scattered throughout the room. Now that the stone was destroyed, Bob commanded the Chimera. Bob ordered the Chimera to destroy the wall. Henry was surprised to see the wall being destroyed and Bob commanding the Chimera. Bob, with a piercing gaze, turned to the group and said, Our enemy is different. Leo, without hiding his anxious anticipation, asked who our true enemy was. The main character answered with a heavy sigh. This is the creator of the Chimera. It's your choice to go with me or not. Bob resolutely headed inside the destroyed wall. Henry, looking at Leo worriedly, asked what we would do. Looking ahead with determination, Leo replied, Let's follow him first. The heroes followed the Chimera and Bob into the destroyed passage. The room they entered resembled an ominous torture chamber. Its walls were covered with dark marks and frightening mechanisms. At the end of the room stood a mysterious silhouette in a cloak, his figure shrouded in darkness. Beneath the cloak was a disfigured figure his body covered in scars and distortions that told a story of long suffering and madness. The Chimera, sensing his presence, growled. The character was trying to sew together body parts scattered on the table. Do not kill the Chimera, but come to me with it, turning to the heroes, said the creator of the Chimera. With a grim smile, he added, It's interesting that you seem to have come in the midst of my work. The character gave Bob and Leo an appraising look, his eyes twinkling with sinister interest. Leo's face turned red with anger and he felt his patience running out. Leo, with anger in his voice, told the character, You can try to control us, but remember one thing, we will not become part of your terrible games. Bob, noticing Leo's outburst of anger, calmly said, Don't get excited, Leo, we need to keep our cool. The character watched them with sinister interest. The main character, pointing to his eyes, asked, Do you know who they are? Bob showed his eyes more clearly, trying to attract attention. The character, seeing Bob's eyes, exploded with rage. The room was filled with the sounds of battle. The main character repelled the character's attack using a fire whirlwind. His hand flashed brightly as he created a powerful field of fire. The heroes quickly prepared for battle, taking up positions. The character, looking at Bob with burning anger, shouted, You are related to that monkey! Strange monsters began to emerge from the dark corners of the room. Their bodies deformed and twisted into eerie shapes. Bob, using the chimera, broke through the monsters that tried to surround him. While he was fighting the monsters, Leo's allies arrived. Leo shouted with complete determination, let's wipe them out, his voice full of fighting spirit and energy. The battle began. The sounds of metal and magic were heard. Every blow, spell, and maneuver was aimed at breaking through the enemy ranks and supporting Bob. Each of them, despite fatigue and danger, continued to fight with incredible determination. Bob, with determination, quickly approached the character. The Chimera's creator, seeing Bob approaching, suddenly raised his hands and a massive protective coffin appeared from the shadows. The character suddenly held a staff that emitted an ominous light. Bob, gathering all his strength, 
smashed the coffin with a powerful blow. The hero's arm increased slightly in size, and his muscles strengthened before his eyes. This was a new skill that he acquired, strengthened by his internal energy. The creator couldn't believe his eyes when he saw it. He was shocked. Bob looked impressive. His arm radiated power, and his eyes glowed with a fiery light. Seeing Bob demonstrate his powers, he suddenly realized that the hero was somehow connected to Olympus. Bob clenched his fist and his muscles tensed. The creator of the Chimera screamed loudly in despair and rage. He swung his staff. The magical runes on its surface sparkled. Bob, not paying attention to the character's furious waving of the staff, walked decisively towards him. The character again summoned a reinforced coffin, which appeared in the air, surrounded by powerful protective magic. The main character, without slowing down, again struck a powerful blow at the reinforced coffin. The creator, in desperation, summoned a poisonous cloud that quickly filled the room, green smoke swirling ominously. Bob briefly remembered the words of his comrade, who had once warned him about the importance of protection. The fist rushed towards the enemy with a powerful roar. The blow was so strong that it shook the air. After a powerful blow, the hand began to emit a green glow, filling with magical energy. The creator was thrown back with incredible force. Bob's eyes, breaking through the shadows, emitted a red light. The creator of the Chimera, gathering the last remnants of his magical energy, summoned a black wall of thorns. The character thought to himself with grim satisfaction, this is my strongest skill. He felt the magical energy concentrating in the black spikes and knew that he was now using all his power. But Bob could not be stopped. Despite the spikes and deadly traps, he continued to approach the character. With the magical light emanating from the staff, he hoped to stop the hero's relentless onslaught. The creator, feeling that his last defense was beginning to crack, tensed to the limit, his face distorted with tension. The creator's defenses cracked under Bob's pressure. Bob, having overcome the last obstacles and approached the creator, grabbed him by the throat with incredible force. The main character pinned the character to the floor, squeezing his throat with unrelenting force. The creator was terrified, his eyes widened in fear. The main character hit him powerfully in the face. The hero, feeling that victory was close, began to violently beat the character. His eyes burned with fire, reflecting rage and determination, searching for the vulnerability of his creator. In the midst of the furious attack, Bob suddenly remembered the monkey's words. Use the power of your eyes in a moment of rage. You can see everything with them, he told Bob. Concentrate on finding weak points and attack with purpose, he continued. Bob continued to hit harder to cause maximum damage and drain his opponent's strength. The creator, breathing heavily through groans and pain, said with difficulty, I still won't die. Bob's eyes emitted a bright light, which became even more intense with anger. The main character, focusing his gaze on the character, noticed the vulnerabilities in his body. The hero quickly and decisively grabbed the creator's hand and pulled it out. The creator, sensing that his defeat was inevitable, began to beg Bob to stop. But Bob's determination and fury were so powerful that they left no room for compassion or doubt. Bob grabbed the creator's leg, pressing with incredible force. The words of his friends flashed through Bob's thoughts again, giving him additional strength. The joy of victory reigned in Bob's thoughts. He felt deep satisfaction that he had finally achieved his goal and defeated the enemy. Bob stood in front of the creator's body. The character was defeated. His body lay motionless on the floor. The monsters summoned by the creator fell to the floor, their bodies immobilized. The rest of the heroes, watching how the monsters summoned by the creator fell and lost their power, were surprised. Calm down, they won't be a threat anymore, Bob said. Thea, looking around the surroundings and noticing the tension on the faces of her allies, asked if no one was injured. Noticing that Meg looked especially bad, Thea hurried to her to help. That's all, Leo asked, turning to Bob with a tired tone. Let's move away, Leo suggested taking a step back. Leo looked intensely at Bob, his gaze focused and penetrating. Someone got hurt because of your choices, Leo began, his voice serious. Leo asked if it was necessary to kill the creator. Bob, meeting Leo's gaze, answered with confidence. Yes, it was necessary. Leo continued with a slight anger on his face. You could have broken the record anyway without setting anyone up. The main character thought for a moment and remembered a battle from the past. He remembered how at that time his choice also required sacrifices and difficult decisions. Bob, deeply aware of his answer, said with a heavy sigh, It was impossible to do otherwise. Leo, after hearing Bob's explanation, still couldn't understand what he was talking about. Leo was about to leave absorbed in thoughts when suddenly the manager appeared. The character turned around and saw some beggar next to Bob. Bob, 
noticing the appearance of the manager, said, The manager is here. Leo, immediately realizing the significance of the moment, bowed with respect. The manager, looking at Leo with genuine anger, said, You started from Olympus. I'm ready to tear out Zeus's beard right now. The manager grabbed his head, expressing despair and shock. Because of you, Bob, I will have a lot of work again, he continued. The character, with a deep sigh, tried to change his tone and added, But I am here to reward you, and handed Bob the blue crystal sparkling in his hand. The crystal emitted a dark and mysterious light. Bob, taking the black god stone, thought to himself, We need two more. Collecting the remaining stones will be easier than I expected, the hero thought to himself in surprise. All rewards have been received, now I am sending you to the tower. The manager made a gesture with his hand, and the space in front of the heroes began to flicker. The manager added with a clear hint of severity, Do not create disorder there. The character remained where he was, watching their progress with an expression of serious satisfaction and anticipation. In an instant, the heroes found themselves in the vicinity of the tower. Two strangers, noticing the appearance of the heroes, immediately drew attention to them. Bob thought to himself, Everyone here is a player now. Leo, examining the surroundings, noticed several figures. These people wore clothes and symbols characteristic of the Olympians. He asked Bob, Are you not going to join the guild? Bob replied, No, I'm not going to join the guild. Then he added, By the way, about meeting the manager. Leo asked with interest what you want to say. His voice was full of curiosity and expectation. The main character continued, with a serious expression on his face. You need to find out all the ins and outs of Olympus yourself. That's all, Bob said and, having finished the conversation, got ready to leave. Bob, waving his hand goodbye, added, Be careful with jackals. One of the Olympians approached Leo and bowed, his presence immediately attracting attention. The Olympian who approached Leo turned out to be Greg, Ares's chief of guard. Leo asked what you wanted. Greg replied with a cold and domineering tone, I wanted to know how ready you are for the test. His words full of contempt and arrogance made Leo angry. Leo, angry felt anger boiling in his chest, he tensed and prepared to strike. Greg, noticing Leo's intention and reading his anger on his face, said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, my words were misunderstood. Leo, still not hiding his displeasure, snapped, Go! Before leaving, Greg asked who it was with you, to which Leo replied that he was a friend. Ahead, beyond the horizon, the city loomed, its silhouette clearly outlined against the sky. Jackals are robbing new players who have not joined the guild, Bob thought to himself. He knew that if the jackals posed a real threat, then action had to be taken. The hero, continuing to think, suddenly felt that he was being watched. His instincts became wary. Great, I'll check something on them, Bob continued to think. The observers wore wolf masks that hid their faces. These people were clearly planning an attack and were already preparing for action. Suddenly, as if disappearing into thin air, Bob disappeared. The observers froze in place, surprised and confused. Severed heads fell to the ground at different speeds. The jackals realized that they were faced with something much more dangerous than they expected. One by one, Bob methodically and mercilessly eliminated the jackals. Bob grabbed one of the jackals, his hands gripping his opponent tightly. The main character took off the mask from one of the jackals, and underneath it a frightened red-haired man was revealed. I have a question, the hero said in a firm and decisive tone. Bob raised his hand, preparing to strike. The main character hit, under the pressure of pain and threats. The character, gripped by fear, shouted, Okay, okay, I will answer all the questions. Bob, keeping his voice tense, asked where to find Cloudless. The city at night was truly magnificent. The reflection of the lights danced on the water of the canals, creating mesmerizing patterns. The main character was sitting in a cozy restaurant located on one of the crowded streets. Bob stretched his neck feeling the tension and fatigue from previous events gradually recede. The nearby bazaar was bustling with people, and street vendors were attracting the attention of shoppers with their colorful wares. The hero remembered how he used to spend time here with his comrades. These memories were full of warmth and nostalgia. Bob abruptly returned to reality. Realizing that this was not the time to be nostalgic, he took out the stone that the manager gave him. The main character knew who to go to with this stone. Bob knew a blacksmith who could help him process the stone, the hero went outside where the air was fresh. A man stood in front with a boy. He held the boy as if protecting him. Without stopping, Bob walked past the man and the boy. Suddenly, the hero felt a knife pressing into his back. Bob, with a deft throw, knocked over the stranger who was trying to attack. Other gang members ran up, ready to support their comrade. 
Bob quickly dealt with the rest of the gang using his skills and strength. He told them not to rob anymore and left, leaving behind tired and battered bandits. There was a blacksmith sign on the house, decorated with an image of a hammer and shield. It swayed in the wind, creating a light metallic sound. Bob walked inside and the warmth of the forge enveloped him. The blacksmith was muscular, with gray hair that caught his eye. Despite his age, he looked strong and full of vitality. He asked Bob, Are you lost? Bob, examining the sword, replied that he had come specifically to him. The hero took the sword, examined it, and said that it was of poor quality. At this, the blacksmith frowned, his face becoming tense with dissatisfaction. The blacksmith took the hammer and his eyes lit up with fire. He asked Bob where he came from. Bob took out a sphere with the number one on it. The main character took out a crystal, the blacksmith. Seeing this, looked closely and became interested. The blacksmith peered into the crystal with deep interest, his eyes filled with curiosity, following the play of light. Bob asked if the blacksmith could cut the crystal. Even after you saw the lousy goods of this forge, are you ready to entrust it to me? The blacksmith asked in surprise. The main character answered yes, to which the blacksmith, with dissatisfaction and disgust, said, crazy and turned around. Bob picked up the sword again and examined it carefully, carefully checking every detail. He said that the sword may be bad, but the blacksmith's handwriting can still be traced. The character looked at the hero with unexpected interest. What are you doing? He asked, looking at Bob with obvious surprise. The blacksmith, after a pause, nevertheless agreed to take on the order, his face gradually filling with determination. Patrick, that was the name of the blacksmith, put forward the condition that no one should know about the order, Bob agreed, promising to keep the secret. Bob sat and dined in the tavern, enjoying the comfort and taste of the food. Smiling, Leo sat down next to him. I've been looking for you for a long time, he said, sitting down at the table and pouring himself a drink. Give me your number already, Leo demanded comically. I didn't think the man would shoot at my number, Bob replied. The waiter approached them, holding a tray in his hands. Bob turned to Leo. Can you help me with one thing? Leo chewing asked what? Kill the leader of the jackals, Bob answered. Leo choked and put his fork in his mouth to clear his throat. Okay, tomorrow night, Leo said, then got up and left, leaving Bob alone at the table. Bob noticed that someone was watching him, feeling a gaze that would not leave him alone. The stranger approached, took off his hood and introduced himself as Gregor. He sat down at Bob's table without waiting for an invitation and sat opposite him, looking at him carefully. You took first place, Leo second. There are rumors that you are a monster, he began. Oh, I'll take that as a compliment, Bob replied without losing confidence. Gregor took a sip of tea, his face unreadable. Come to my master Ares, he continued, pausing to give Bob time to think. Bob said that's enough and drank his tea, not paying attention to the offer. So you refuse Olympus's offer, Gregor said after Bob. Bob replied that he would not work with unworthy people. Gregor sat angry, his face was gloomy and tense. He thought about it and began to formulate a plan, carefully planning how to use the jackals to accomplish his goal. A servant approached him, approaching cautiously. We will kill Bob with the help of the jackals, Gregor said, his voice full of cold calculation. Prepare a hundred men, he told his servants, confidently and decisively. First, follow me, Bob said to Leo, leading him along. Leo looked at Bob silently, his gaze full of anticipation. The creator's words flashed through Leo's head. Bob walked forward along the street, confidently leading the way. Leo was deep in thought, lost in thought. While Bob confidently moved forward, Bob called out to him. Hey, Leo, it's okay, with slight concern in his voice. They entered the store where there was only one person who carefully watched their entrance. Bob asked if you were cloudless, and the man, noticing the alarm, immediately tried to run away. The main character instantly caught up with him, grabbing him by the shoulder and stopping the fugitive. The stranger tried to pull out the knife. Not allowing the attack to be made, Bob neutralized it with a deft throw. He pinned him to the floor and said, sit, with steely determination in his voice. Bob, holding the stranger on the floor, said, I need the king of the jackals. He tied Cloudless, carefully wrapping the ropes and ensuring that he could not escape. He looks frail. It's unlikely that it's him, Leo said, examining the bound man with doubt. Look at this knife, Bob said, showing Leo the weapon he had taken from Cloudless. There is a high level of poison on him. It's definitely him, Bob continued. The man was sitting tied up. Cloudless's face and voice changed, and he said how the information was leaked. There you go, Bob said to Leo, confirming that this man was Cloudless. Do you even know who is behind me? Cloudless spoke threateningly. Leo remembered Bob's words before they entered. 
a warning that they might encounter someone dangerous. Lightning filled the room. Bright light and crackling filled the space. Bob asked, Do you take orders from Gregor? Cloudless's face distorted and he answered yes. We have a favor to ask you, Leo said. Bob continued, Gather all the jackals and come to the indicated place by midnight, and then Olympus will reward you. The main character asked if you could handle it. His voice was full of confidence. Bob slipped the note to Cloudless, not letting him go. Let's go, Bob said to Leo, pulling him towards the exit. Maybe you can explain everything, Leo began when they went outside. You want me to believe that the jackals and Olympus are working together, Leo continued. Believe it or not, it's up to you, answered Bob. But you heard everything yourself. The next day, Bob was waiting for Leo near the city gates. If you had stayed a little longer, I would have gone alone, Bob said when Leo finally approached. I thought about your words. Even though Olympus was my home, I must find out everything, Leo said, deciding to go with Bob. The figure of his mother flashed through Leo's head. Her image was full of love and wisdom, reminding him of the importance of the decision he had made. After talking a little more, they decided to hit the road. There shouldn't be any jackals, Leo said, taking on his battle form. Meanwhile, not far from the city, jackals gathered in a cave, preparing for their plan and discussing the details of the upcoming conspiracy. The most important of the jackals asked if everything was in place. His voice was stern and demanding. One of the jackals coughed, attracting the attention of the main one. Everyone gathered and raised their heads, listening carefully to the main one, Cloudless, who stood in front of them. He raised his sword and, greeting everyone, said, Today, we will change the course of events. Everyone raised their hands in the air, rejoicing and welcoming the upcoming changes. Two more people appeared in masks. These are our patrons from Olympus, the chief said. He bowed to them and greeted them. The chief handed them a wad of Asgardian money, saying, This is payment for your help. Let it become the beginning of a great alliance between us. One of the strangers took the money and remained silent, his face remaining hidden under a mask. Great, the stranger said, putting the money in his inventory. All that remains is to say goodbye. Snapping his fingers, the stranger said, and everything around burst into flames. A blinding light filled the cave, leaving only shadows and smoke. The jackals began to burn and scream, their terrible screams mingling with the crackling fire and howling flames as they tried to escape the deadly firestorm. Leo was the first to emerge from behind the mask, his eyes blazing with determination as he tore the fabric and stepped into the fiery chaos. Bob then revealed his identity by removing his mask and drawing his sword. Leo did not spare anyone who tried to escape, each blow preventing any escape for the jackals. The main jackal, in a panic, tried to contact someone through his ball, but his efforts were interrupted by Bob, who destroyed the amulet with his sword, leaving no chance for help. The character, surrounded by flames, looked at the heroes with an expression of extreme horror and despair. He took off his mask, revealing his distorted face, and full of rage and despair, rushed into battle with Bob. Cloudless screamed in pain as Bob landed another blow, breaking through his defenses. The main character dealt the final blow to Cloudless. After the heroes had completed their cleanup and were confident that the threat had been eliminated, they exited the cave and found themselves in the fresh air. Leo looked at Bob and sighed. Leo was silent, looking at Bob, and internally realized that he was not used to the cruelty of war and murder. How can you be so calm? Leo asked. Bob looked at Leo and replied that sometimes, to survive, you have to accept reality as it is and not let your emotions get in the way of action. You didn't seem kind before, Leo said. Bob shrugged and replied that sometimes being cruel is a necessity, not a choice. The main character took out a wad of money and said that they did not just get into this business and invited Leo to split the money. Leo was surprised and asked, Seriously, do you really feel that way about this money? You can refuse, Bob began. But Leo interrupted him. Okay, let's split it. You never told me what the manager gave you as a reward, Bob said. Nervously pounding his fist on the table, Gregor exclaimed why he couldn't contact Cloudless. At the same time, a man ran into the tavern and, out of breath, said, I found the jackals, they are all dead. After some time, they stood in a cave in front of a mountain of corpses, indicating the complete elimination of the jackals. Gregor became enraged, looking at the mountain of corpses and began to scream. Bob was about to lie down on the bed. The hero, examining the contents of his inventory, decided to examine the egg that he received as a reward. Bob took the egg in his hands, studying it. It was an unusual color and had mysterious symbols that he could not decipher. If Leo had received the Hand of Thunder, then the egg might be equal in value and potential power, Bob thought. Suddenly, for a second, the space around Bob changed. The egg greeted him. Bob recognized the patterns on the egg as symbolism of the outer gods, 
and realized that it was connected to ancient and powerful forces. What the hell are you, Bob thought. The main character approached the door of the forge. Patrick was working on something, intently forging metal, when Bob entered the forge. I processed your stone, he began. What kind of armor do you prefer? He continued, pointing to a strange bottle. It just turned out to be a byproduct. And it can be used to make armor, Patrick added. I don't have the materials, Bob said. Patrick stood up abruptly and said, That's enough mithril. The blacksmith showed a piece of mithril, shiny and durable. Patrick said that the cost would be high, since the mithril and work required significant expenses, but emphasized that the quality of the product would justify the price. Bob thought about it. The hero suggested that Bob take the product on credit, promising flexible payment terms. Bob agreed to the offer and took out his sword so Patrick could evaluate it. Okay, Patrick said. So it's a blade. A week passed. Gregor stood and thought about how to get his lost money back. A soldier approached him and told him that all the players in support had gathered. Then go ahead, said Gregor. Meanwhile, Bob continued to kill monsters to level up. But the level rose very slowly, and Bob felt that much more effort would be required to achieve the desired progress. At the same time, in the forge, Patrick examined the stone. He studied each of its patterns and features. Suddenly a noise was heard, and Patrick became alert, listening to the sounds coming from behind the door of the forge. Taking his hammer, the hero headed towards the door, warily preparing for a possible threat. Going out into the street, Patrick saw a detachment of soldiers led by Gregor. I didn't expect to see you in such a hole. That's why they couldn't find you, Gregor began. We have come for you, Hephaestus, pointing his sword continued. Hephaestus struck a powerful blow with his hammer, and the sound echoed throughout the area. The soldiers, seeing the power of the blow and the rage of Hephaestus, recoiled in fear, trying to maintain their distance. A mysterious player with flaming hair and clothes that sparkled in shades of red and white appeared. He pulled out a shining spear, and Hephaestus stood in a fighting stance, ready for battle. Hephaestus decisively rushed forward, delivering the first crushing blow. Ricky, that was the character's name, instantly blocked the crushing blow. He deftly grabbed Hephaestus' hammer, seizing the initiative in the battle. Hephaestus forcefully threw the hero away. Hephaestus' eyes sparkled with rage. He dealt a powerful blow, capable of breaking everything in its path. Hephaestus slightly injured Ricky, leaving a painful mark on his body. Ricky prepared to counterattack, intending to turn the pain into his strength. Sparks and lightning flew through the air as Ricky quickly approached Hephaestus. A strong roar was heard throughout the city. Hephaestus, struck by the blow, began to turn into stone. Ricky used the Medusa shield created by Hephaestus against the hero. Hephaestus, completely petrified, fell to the ground. Quickly immerse the criminal, Gregor ordered the soldiers. Words won't do that, Bob suddenly appeared. Lousy people in this wonderful place, he continued. Ricky looked at Bob with curiosity and interest, his eyes clearly assessing the strength and determination of his opponent. Gregor stared at Bob tensely, his voice full of anger and surprise. Bob looked confidently at Gregor and said, I'm his client. The main character used a fire whirlwind and turned the soldiers into living flames, dancing in chaos. Bob activated his fiery eyes and began to look for a trajectory to attack. With powerful jerks, Bob scattered the soldiers like puppets. He looked around like a hunter carefully studying the field. And without wasting any time, he released spheres of mana that flared up in bright streams, tearing apart the space in front of him. There was a deafening explosion. Do you think you can cope only with numbers? The hero said with confidence. The soldiers rushed towards him like a wave, unaware of the formidable power they would face. The hero activated a giant fire, and his eyes sparkled with rage, reflecting the power that could consume everything around him. Bob looked around to see if Hephaestus had awakened, Ricky broke through the blazing fire and stabbed Bob. Rubbing his face, Bob gathered his strength. Ricky, slowly brushing away the fire, asked why Bob needed Hephaestus. Bob, taking the sword out of his inventory, replied that he needed Hephaestus to create a unique item. The main character activated the giant's skill, and his hand was filled with power, as if the power of the whole world was concentrated in it. Like a flash of lightning, Ricky threw his fire spear at Bob. Bob, swinging, deflected Ricky's fiery spear, his hand meeting the flying spear with incredible strength. The hero, concentrating his energy, created spheres of mana that flared up around him. They began to slowly rotate. With a shout, Bob released mana spheres at Ricky. Ricky stood, his hand trembling, holding tightly to his shoulder from which blood flowed, drops of which fell to the ground. Bob activated the giant's power again, and a powerful aura wrapped around his arm. But before Bob had time to fully compose himself, 
Ricky, with strength and swiftness, struck him with a powerful blow, his fist cutting through the air and crashing into Bob. Bob coughed up blood and red droplets came out of his mouth. Ricky put all his strength into this blow. The hero was thrown back by a powerful blow and, like a projectile, flew through the air, breaking through the wall of the forge with a deafening roar. I greatly underestimated him, Bob thought to himself as he felt pain coursing through his body. He will be hard to deal with, Bob muttered, looking around the ruined walls of the forge and clenching his jaw. Great job, Gregor said as he approached Ricky. A strange sound came from a hole in the wall, like the mysterious whisper of ancient shadows. Suddenly, a blue light erupted from the hole, tearing through the darkness like a flash of mysterious energy. Bob came out of the forge, and in his hand, the stone that Hephaestus was working on sparkled. The stone shimmered with a mysterious light, as if it contained a mysterious power. Don't interfere, Ricky said, his voice stern and commanding. Bob stood, his eyes glowing with a fiery light. In one hand he held a dark stone, shrouded in a mysterious glow. In the other, a sword. Where are they going? Bob asked, launching spheres of mana at the soldiers. Bob grabbed the petrified Hephaestus. Kill him, Gregor ordered the soldiers. At his command, the soldiers, like an uncontrollable avalanche, rushed towards Bob. Bob used the dark stone, and a whirlwind of dark energy flared up around him. The soldiers were destroyed, their bodies collapsed, and their eyes, filled with the light of dark energy, flickered with an unnatural light. Ricky, gathering all his will, decided to kill Bob at any cost. Bob fought with the soldiers, each blow of the sword scattering the enemies. Ricky prepared to attack, his body tense like a spring, ready for a sudden jump, and his eyes focused on Bob. Bob was ready to defend himself. His body took a strong stance, and his sword and dark stone were in constant readiness. Ricky spread his arms wide, and his gesture was like the opening of huge wings, and magical energy began to flow from his roar. Bob clutched the stone in his hand, and his fingers wrapped around it like a powerful vice. They clashed, and a massive explosion exploded at the center of the collision, a huge wave of energy and sparks shooting out from the epicenter, throwing Bob and Ricky back. Bob was unconscious, his body lying lifeless among the rubble. Gregor, noticing this, decided to take advantage of the moment. But Hephaestus intervened, and the spell was finally lifted from the petrified body. Come on, get away, little sucker, Hephaestus said with rage. His voice was like thunder. I will finish you off, Hephaestus shouted. Gregor was scared. Hephaestus swung his hammer, and his muscles tensed like steel springs. But the floor manager intervened and stopped Hephaestus's hammer. The manager threw away Hephaestus's hand, as if deflecting the blowing stream of wind. The manager looked at the Olympians with a menacing look. Gregor was trembling with fear. His body was shaking, his face was pale, and his eyes were full of horror. The manager knocked the helmet off Gregor's head with a click, and it flew to the side like a projectile. The character touched his finger to Gregor's forehead. This gesture was a reminder of greatness and power, and Gregor, feeling the touch, understood that every word he had to convey to Zeus would be carefully checked and weighed. Hephaestus smiled, and his smile was full of shadow and irony, like the glow of the night. The last fight scene was the last thing Bob remembered. Bob began to come to his senses as he lay on his bed, his body surrounded by soft light filtering through the curtains. Hephaestus hovered above him, his face seeming to float in the air. Are you okay? Hephaestus asked, his voice deep and concerned. How did it all end? Bob asked, his voice worried. Everything is fine, Hephaestus answered. His voice was calm and confident. Thank you, but go to the hospital, he continued. Hephaestus took the pickaxe, and his hands tightly grasped the handle. He said that his name was not Patrick, but Hephaestus. Bob was not surprised. He knew who he was. In gratitude, I will make you the best blade, Hephaestus continued. Bob was delighted. His face lit up with a slight smile. The main character got out of bed and, with a slight smile on his lips, said, I'll wait. Time passed. Bob fought with the gorillas. The stone is strong, Bob thought to himself, feeling his hand filling with power and heaviness. But it was difficult to constantly control it. The stone, despite its strength, exerted continuous pressure and resistance, requiring more and more concentration and effort from Bob. I need to become stronger, he thought, realizing that the current efforts and control of the stone required much more skill and power. Bob entered the forge, judging by the silence. You finished, the hero began. Yes, everything is ready, Hephaestus answered. His voice was confident and satisfied. He handed Bob the box. Bob shook the box, trying to understand what was in it. The sound of the contents was soft and mysterious. We agreed on the blade, Bob said. 
This is a surprise box, Bob asked when Hephaestus urged him to open it. Bob opened the box and there was a glove inside. He carefully tried it on. Her material hugged his arm perfectly. There was a groove in the glove into which a stone could be inserted, Hephaestus said. Bob was delighted. His eyes sparkled. And here is a blade for you, Hephaestus continued, handing Bob an elegant sword. The hero took it. The handle was decorated with intricate engravings and the blade sparkled like frozen light. Bob called it the Sword of the Dark Knight. He has such good taste in names, Hephaestus thought to himself. The main character was pleased. His face glowed with satisfaction as he hung the sword on his belt. Do you plan to climb further? Hephaestus asked with curiosity. Yes, I want to overthrow Olympus, Bob answered. Hephaestus raised his eyebrows in surprise and said, Really? Okay, go. I won't see you off, Hephaestus said after Bob. The hero went out into the street. A dry farewell then and now, Bob thought to himself. Fragments from the past flashed through Bob's mind. Bob bowed to the forge door as a sign of respect and farewell. The Colosseum's test supervisor, Shuri, sat at the table. Shuri took a bite of the chocolate, each piece melting on her tongue. Shuri studied Bob's file, her gaze moving like that of a scientist working on an important discovery. Came alone for the test, Shuri thought to herself, her gaze lingering on Bob. Well, let him try as much as he likes, she said to herself. Bob was in the center of the Colosseum arena, his figure clearly visible in a huge circle surrounded by high walls. This test is simple. You just need to defeat the enemy, Bob thought to himself, looking around the arena. In the past, my entry was in 12th place, Bob noted to himself, looking at the leaderboard. Bob drew his sword, and its blade illuminated in the light of the arena like a sparkling line. The test began. The sound of the shaking crowd and the sounds of magic filling the arena. A huge orc appeared. His muscular body was covered with dark skin, and every step he took shook the ground, making a dull rumble. The orc's eyes glowed with an ominous red light. The orc rushed at Bob, his heavy steps shaking the arena like blows of a hammer on an anvil. Bob, gathering all his strength, cut the orc in half with one blow, the sword cutting through the air with lightning speed. Shuri was surprised, her eyes widening in surprise. Bob's eyes glowed with a fiery light, emitting a bright glow like hot coals. Bob fought without a break, passing test after test. His movements were like lightning bursts in a storm. His every action was precise and decisive. His body moved in the dance of battle, not allowing itself the slightest weakening. Each new challenge only fueled his determination to reach the end. The fighter was kneeling in front of him, head down. This is my second defeat, he began, his voice weakening. If your sword had not been worn out, it would have been more difficult for me, Bob said, touching his head. Bob defeated him. He stood over his defeated opponent, his breathing was even and calm. Finally reached the 20th round, Bob thought to himself, his thoughts filled with pride. They don't even let me rest, Bob thought. The air around the hero began to spin, forming a vortex of magical energy. The gates opened and their heavy doors creaked like ancient steel monsters. Bob brought all his skills to bear, and his actions were synchronized in one swift flow. The appearance of the enemy was terrifying and mysterious. His figure was surrounded by darkness. It headed towards Bob, and its every movement was like a dark storm moving towards its goal. Overwhelm me even with the strength of giants, Bob thought to himself. Bob was thrown back a little. He felt the ground shaking beneath him. Bob discovered the true appearance of the snake. His body began to distort and change, turning into a writhing scaly mass covered in shades of black and pink. An excellent opponent, Bob thought to himself with a slight smile. The snake was as huge as the sea. Its huge fangs looked like sharp blades, ready to tear apart any barrier, and its eyes emitted fiery light, like two luminous torches in the night. This light created a feeling of heat and power, ready to defeat any enemy. He attacked Bob, and his fangs flashed in the air with terrifying speed. Bob dodged with lightning speed, his body slid to the side. I can't make mistakes, Bob thought to himself. Bob began to run like lightning, leaving only a flickering trail behind him. The wind ripped through the air around him, creating a feeling of relentless force and speed. The serpent moved to crush him, and its massive body unfolded like a giant wave. The hero jumped above him and flew over the massive body of the snake as it tried to grab him. Bob concentrated the power into his blade, and his sword glowed with a bright, blinding blue light. He struck, and the blade cut through the air with a bright flash. The snake dodged. He twisted, using his flexibility and speed. Bob's eyes began to calculate the trajectory. Their light became more intense. Shuri watched the spectacle, her eyes glued to the arena. She studied every movement of Bob and the kite. Her face remained calm. 
but internally she was absorbed in what was happening in front of her. The arena was in chaos. The air was filled with sparks and explosions of energy, every blow and maneuver creating a storm of light and shadow. Shuri couldn't believe it when she saw it, her eyes widening in surprise. Bob's burning eyes left a trail behind them, like two bright torches. He quickly walked towards the snake. His movements were like a fast arrow. He jumped onto the snake, his body sliding along the scales. The main character concentrated the power of the giants in his hand, and its muscles tensed to the limit. Shuri tensed, her body frozen in anticipation. Bob aimed for the only place on the serpent's body where there were no scales, a thin, vulnerable area hidden among its armor. The power accumulated, creating a magical field around his hand, filled with seething energy. The blade, surrounded by bright light, pierced a vulnerable spot on the snake's body. The serpent fell, its massive body falling to the ground. Bob removed the blade from the serpent's body, like a master who had completed a complex work. He pulled the sword back, and a light cloud of energy came out of the wound, like a stream of steam. The scales, which had recently sparkled, now froze motionless, and the fiery light in his eyes went out. Bob passed the last test. The arena fell into silence. Shuri approached him, her steps quiet. Did you know about the snake's weak spot? She asked, her voice laced with curiosity. No, Bob replied, pointing his finger at his eyes. I used my abilities. Well, that's interesting, Shuri said, her face showing respect and interest. I have to give you something as an additional reward, Shuri said, her voice serious. She reached her hand towards one of her blades. The manager said to give it to someone who would kill the snake, Shuri continued as Bob took the sword in his hands. Bob examined the blade, and his face changed when he noticed that it was broken. What's going on? He asked in surprise, his voice full of bewilderment. Well, okay, Bob thought. The main reward is the heart of the serpent. Shuri congratulated Bob, her voice full of sincere approval and joy. Thank you, Bob said, his voice full of gratitude as he looked at Shuri with respect. Suddenly, the egg in Bob's inventory began to complain of hunger, making melodious and insistent sounds. A strange energy enveloped everything around, as if an invisible curtain of light and darkness had enveloped the arena. Shuri tensed and pulled out her sword, her movements quick and decisive. This energy began to eat the snake's body. Shuri watched this, her gaze full of surprise and anxiety. She stood motionless. The snake began to lose its shape. Its body began to blur and dissolve in a whirlwind of luminous particles. He's eating a corpse, Bob said, his words sounding like an admission that what was happening was beyond the ordinary. The scales, once sparkling, now disintegrated into pieces that were absorbed by strange energy. The egg, having eaten, began to fall asleep again. What does this mean? Bob thought to himself, his mind swirling with questions and doubts. Shuri asked, Do you know what's in the egg? Bob, a little embarrassed and still concerned, replied that he didn't know. Okay, I won't divulge anything that happened here, Shuri said. It was nice to meet you, Shuri said, and extended her hand in a friendly gesture. Bob, accepting her hand, saw her silhouette in the past. They shook hands and said goodbye. A week later, Bob was already tested in the maze. The main character simply broke through the walls and left the maze. It's time to go to Hephaestus, he muttered, decisively stepping forward. Hephaestus watched, dripping with sweat, his body covered in beads of sweat, and his eyes following every movement. Bob entered the forge. A slight thrill from the hot air and the sounds of the forge surrounded him. I've come to pick up my order, uncle, Bob began. I asked you not to call me uncle, Hephaestus said. Wait there, I'll finish soon, he added. Answer quickly, Hephaestus said. His voice was full of liveliness and interest. Are you not hot? He asked, glancing at Bob. Bob smiled back. His expression was calm and confident. Hephaestus, noticing this, asked him how Bob was going to proceed further. Your blade is ready, Hephaestus said, proudly showing the completed product. Bob picked up the blade to inspect it, and his eyes lit up with admiration as he ran his fingers along the smooth surface of the blade, testing its balance and edge. I like it. Bob said, and carefully put it in his inventory. Bob paid for the work, giving Hephaestus the amount they had discussed. Hephaestus accepted the money with gratitude. His face lit up with a satisfied smile. I'll be back, uncle, Bob said, his voice full of confidence and friendly warmth. After a while, Bob headed towards the portal, its glowing opening beckoning and attracting him to new adventures. Finally, I'm going to moor him, Bob thought to himself. His thoughts filled with excitement and anticipation. Various people offered new players to join their guild. They enthusiastically talked about their achievements, opportunities, and advantages. There was a lot of activity around, 
people discussing their plans, noisy groups preparing for the next test. No different from a bazaar, Bob noted to himself, watching the bustling activity around him. A character in beautiful clothes approached the hero. His outfit sparkled and shimmered. The character had a sword on his back, exquisitely decorated and clearly of high quality, and greeted the protagonist with a slight smile. He invited Bob to join his clan, but Bob, without hesitation, responded with a sharp refusal. The character drew his sword, its blade glinting in the sunlight. If you touch a newly promoted player, it will reflect badly on the clan's reputation, Bob said, his voice firm and confident. 